Okay, that's better. I can hear myself. We are on. Yes, I left the. Uh, I left the I left twelve years ago, and I don't like I don't like it. the further it gets away, <laughs> the further in the past it was, the, the less I like it. Right, okay. the less I like it. It's like yeah. a. <sighs> I think a lot now, and from other people saying it as well, it's like you don't don't make something your identity. Be that an illness, yeah. You know, be that an ideology, yeah, or something that you are, you know gay transgender yeah. black white whatever don't make it your identity ex-military it's really hard yeah, and I, I agree with that but also yeah. i this feeling of oh god it's getting further away that I was in the military it's yeah. i do cling to it in part way a part of part of my identity yeah you know it's like i oh, still i still see myself as an army officer and uh yeah, it's very hard to let go. In fact, I went to the. I, but I, you are, you're a reservist yeah. officer, aren't you? Yeah, I am, yeah. But yeah, it's different, isn't it? Is it? Oh, you can't Ooh, say that. They're the, they're, they're the same. They're the same. They're definitely the same. <laughs> well, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, because I injured myself recently doing, a, like, doing some kite surfing and um, went to the hospital, and the, nurse, the doctor was like, Oh, so what do you do for a living? And I instantly went, Oh, I was in the army. Uh, I mean, I'm a project manager. <laughs> I don't know why. I just instant reaction, and I was, and then yeah. She was like, so, so um, primarily death space, and I was like, yeah, yeah. You know. I'm a PM as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Don't. It's but it's fine. just, it's just different, isn't it's it? It's just, yeah. Yeah. I, I don't necessarily you. want that to be my identity, like it, my the army was, but. Yeah. What did you uh, on the subject of the army? What did you think? Have you seen that case of the, the poor lady killing herself, um. the soldier? recently uh, yeah recently, really recently yeah, oh, well she i think it was last year wasn't it i will have picked i will have read about it but there's unfortunately oh, there's been more than pressure yeah. f- from her um oh it the officer in santos yeah yes yeah I think, oh was it santos was it there Sandus? was there was an officer who no i'm probably i'm sure she, i'm sure there was an, off, uh, an officer cadet female soldier who either attempted or she so did it sure. because she was accused of having an affair with one of the members of staff or something oh, who is this? No, there's one more recent. Let's have a look at this. Here we go. This is it. J. Uh, J. Slee Louise Beck. Mm-hmm. You not seen this one? No, so it's not showing up. I don't know if it's. Oh, sorry. You can't see that. Sorry, sorry, mm-hmm. sorry, sorry. Let's have a look at this now uh, on the screen. Not showing up. Anyway, it was. Uh, God's sake. Yeah, uh, J. Slee Louise Beck. And so she killed herself after here we go. Look, here it is LBC female soldier of 19 took her, uh, yeah, took yeah, her yeah. own I saw life that recently. Yeah, yeah. after intense period of sexual harassment by the boss. A week ago, yeah, shocking. Oh, artillery, you were artillery, weren't you? Yeah, yeah. Um, she but I was friend. reading about it, and the boss sent one. like thousands of messages to her, thousands of messages. Yeah. Oh, god, it's that's horrendous. It is, and <clears throat> when. The thing about it is, people are people are looking at him and thinking, well, this is presuming that he's guilty of anything. Now, obviously, we just, and sending all this stuff and harassing her. With that amount of interaction between them, it must have been visible yeah. from other people <laughs> in the chain of command and peers peers of both people. Yeah, and it still was able to happen. Yeah, it's just. I wonder shocking. if sometimes these things happen in such small little increments that no one no one feels like they can call out call it out because it's like you know if someone does something really bad really obvious like someone goes and grabs someone's ass yep. it, over I don't know in, in the lunch hall or whatever that's really obvious you can call that out when it's sort of like subtle little things I wonder if people either don't know if, they, if they've actually seen what they've seen or they've heard what they've heard and they don't know necessarily that they can call it out but they don't realise it's part of a bigger picture well I think another thing with the, the military is yeah, th- there's this culture that has to re- has to exist in certain environments where you're not to question orders. You're not, which yeah. means which means inherently you're not to question the chain of command, authority, yeah. your authority, and that is absolutely great yeah. for operations in most circumstances. Yeah. Oh well, having said that, there are allowances to yeah. question it in terms of legality, right? Yeah. As you know, yeah. um, but that carries over into at home and you know in camp yeah, and in yeah. barracks things where it shouldn't, but it's. Uh, it, it's all. It must. It's difficult to switch from the one mindset of unquestionable authority, unless in extreme circumstances, yeah. to all of a sudden, oh, we're, we're in a, basically a normal working environment, like office environment, if you want to call it a normal UK laws prevail environment where you 
can and should call this kind of shit out. Yeah. And But in the military, it's very different. Yeah. It's very different. It's a culture I've definitely had to transition <laughs> from because I worked briefly in the cabinet office as on secondment. And, um, when you were serving? I was serving, yeah, last job. Yeah, policy, basically, both times um, that's at the strategic level. But um, the sort of civil service culture is very different to the military one, as you would expect. And, um, you know, the term woke was used <laughs> quite a lot. And we in the military, as you know, have quite a robust sense of, sense of humour. <laughs> don't use that. <laughs> there is language and there is... Uh, sort of approaches that you just don't use in the civil service. <laughs> Nearly had my fingers burnt. <laughs> so you, well, when you say woke was getting used, you and military colleagues were using woke. Well, in no, that no, we. It was sort of that. It was just used to describe the culture in the civil service. Oh, interesting. Which maybe it isn't. Maybe we're just really. Maybe we're just not not as woke as we should be in the army. Uh, particularly but i also think that we have a dark sense of humor for a reason uh, should anybody be woke I don't know. I don't should know. anybody be yeah, woke i don't know i just it's a problem with that term isn't it yeah i got called out for using a word which i won't go into which i was just telling a story in my mind but somebody was offended by that word and in my mind they had no reason to relate to that at all it was a, a racist ter- like term that i was te- i was telling a story it wasn't at anybody it was in telling a story of a story in actual fact and we were having discussion around like anti-racism racism and someone was offended because i used that even said that word out loud and i was like you're a white middle class woman how are you offended <laughs> by that word oh wow but it was that that's just one example i think of how much i felt like I, you have to tiptoe sometimes was it the word it was the one that comes after Mike. <laughs> yeah. In the oh, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, when was this? Oh, this is like a year and a half ago. Oh, that is brave. <clears throat> well, it was I like, realised not to say that word about three years yeah, ago. Yeah. Yeah. To be fair, it was after longer about three that, beers in that. a pub in Whitehall. And I was. it was a story about a, someone else who told me that their <laughs> sergeant major had, had a dog of that name about 30 years ago. I was telling the story about how it's now inappropriate, you know, I was, but I was, I had three beers and said it and I was like, oh, it, idiot. It, isn't it? Yeah, but, but isn't it fucking crazy? Oh, you can swear yeah. on this podcast, right? Okay. Isn't it crazy? Okay. Don't <laughs> say the N-word. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Isn't it crazy yeah. that you can't say a word yeah. regardless of the context? Yeah, you can't say it. Regardless of the context. Yeah. I, something popped into my head um, a few months ago on this topic. I can't remember what I was talking to you about. If I, I might have been talking about the podcast. People listening, I, I apologise if I'm regurg- regurgitating this story. But I am a massive fan of Richard Pryor, the comedian. Yeah. yeah. Black comedian. No longer with us, unfortunately, but yeah. black comedian. Genius. And I re- I remembered telling... Well, I, I remembered years ago, I used to repeatedly tell this joke, this gag that he had yeah. from one of his stand-ups. And it involved the prolific use of the N-word. Yeah. Right? Which So he it's his joke. Yeah. He's saying it, the N-word. Yeah. And I would just repeat the joke. Yeah. I was, and in the context of, this is how good Richard Pryor, you should listen yeah, to Richard, yeah, watch yeah. his stand-up. And I would repeat, it wasn't just the only joke, I'd repeat several jokes. I can't do that now. So and so I'm unable to like use that to demonstrate, that joke yeah. to demonstrate. And it, the joke wasn't about the N-word. He just yeah. happened to use it in the yeah. joke. I can't use it. I can't repeat that amazing like line that he has mm-hmm. to demonstrate how amazing this black guy is because, because it includes the n-word yeah, yeah. even though it's not really used as a slur it's wild yeah. that we can't obviously do that. i i felt mortified that somebody was insulted or offended rather by my use of the word and in hindsight i wish i hadn't used it it was sort of like too relaxed after work three beers telling a story but that what frustrated me was the fact that it then made me feel uncomfortable about having a discussion around anti-racism because i felt like it was a such a sensitive topic and I was like, that's so frustrating because the whole point of that conversation was we were talking about why it's so important to talk about it. Yeah, you have to talk about it, yeah. yeah. A friend, a friend uh, I, had a, I had a reunion, I say a really small reunion with a bunch of reg blokes up here the other week and um, my, one of my, um, one, probably my closest friend, one of my closest friends from when we served and he turned up and here in the car park he just pulled into and he got out and he said, what's happening, N-word? Yeah. Just as a, you yeah. know, because it's just like, it's like what's happening yeah, buddy. But yeah. he used the N word, and he just uses it as funny. Oh, I was, I was shocked yeah. and that he had yeah. said it out loud. I was like, yeah. oh my god! And then I was shocked at myself for being shocked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and do you know what? Each there, and I, 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 do you know what? I've never ever said that word out loud before, and I won't ever say it out loud again. <laughs> so, no, no, it's just so, not worth it. No. And it's the only word. Yeah, everything else you can say, yeah, it's yeah. the only word. 
Yeah. I think I think everything else you can say yeah. about anything. I'm not yeah. just on about like race. Yeah. yeah. Anything. Yeah. Wild times we live in. Yeah. Wild strange, times. Strange point to start on. <laughs> Sorry. Right. Sorry. <laughs> you, you brought it up. Oh God. So going back to the culture thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's tough. It's tough. But you know, this is like the military culture. It. I don't know. Sometimes you can look at it people from the outside can look at it and go oh my god they're so they're so behind mm. they're so behind what we're behind no it's not they're behind it's a totally different thing yeah like military culture runs in parallel to normal civi- civilian culture yeah. and obviously there are many different streams and threads and avenues of and, and subcultures but it's parallel yeah it's not they're 10 years behind no because in 10 years time not going to be what we were, we are now it's completely different yeah completely yeah, different yeah. they're never going to be the same yeah. different world and pe- yeah. people will never understand it it's because we have we have to have a different mindset about how we operate and so naturally our language and our culture and the way we approach things is going to be different I don't, yeah and i've seen that more and more in the civilian world people can be experts in their fields but whether they're leaders or team players totally different ball game mm. yeah mm. It's hard. It is hard. Uh, did I see? Did I see that you are uh, doing? I was going to come at this later. Just popped <laughs> in my head though. Paddleboard in the channel. Uh, we did that in May. You've done it already. Yeah. yeah what yeah. was that like? It so- the thing is that one. It I so- love paddleboard. It sounds- no, I do that. no, no. The thing is, it sounds like one of the gnarliest challenges I did. Actually, it was probably the easiest. Really? <laughs> because it has to be dead flat, calm, and no wind. So it's ha- basically it was a mill pond. And so it's just a long paddle, but it was... And so that was tough. Like, after three and a half... Why does it have to be like that? Because just for safety. Um, so, you it, like, if you have more than, like, 10 knots of wind in the middle of the English Channel, you're just going to... And especially if it's in the wrong direction, you ain't going to make it. Um, it'll just blow you up up into the North Sea. That's probably why Jordan Wiley knocked... Because, you know, have you heard of Jordan Wiley? I've heard of, yeah. Yeah, so he... he it was a few years ago. He was doing around the UK paddle. Oh yes, paddle yes, yes. But he ended up knocking that on the head. Yeah. About oh, he got halfway. Yeah. But I think because it was just taking so long. Yeah. So long. If you're against the wind and if the waves are against you, you know you can have a really good paddleboard. I mean, at some point you might as well just have a canoe. You know, <laughs> you're just getting a bigger and better board. But you stood the entire time. Uh, towards the end. So the way that they do it, I don't know if you want to talk about it now or later, but um, talk about it now, right? Talk about it now. Uh, so. You, the, because you're technically we've done racism yeah. right? we've yeah. done Paddleboard we've done channel. sexual assault <laughs> yeah uh, no this, this one was a, chan- a challenge that was delayed because I tried to do it in November last year which funny old thing is a terrible time to try and get good weather in the channel so we delayed it until the tides were right again in May and you have to do it from uh, uh, Dungness to Boulogne because actually the French shipping the French won't let anything human powered cross their, cha- their shipping channel unless it's swimming the channel which is different so no canoes no kayaks no paddle borders so what they do is you do the same distance that it would be from Calais to Dover but you do it a bit further south and you have to go with the tide so when the tide's going one way you head north and then the tide turns and you head south and they actually pick you up for six nautical miles in the middle because you're not physically allowed to be in that GPS stretch the French authorities will come pick if you you're up human powered. you're human powered and um, the the we had to have a safety boat because I, I didn't think about this. I thought, apart from from a safety point of view, you actually can't see where to aim at because oh, France yeah. is not on the horizon until you're well over. So the boat points in the direction of France, and you align with that because they're just tracking it on. So the what's GPS. the actual distance of the gap? Eighteen nautical miles. Oh, eighteen and and twenty-one. The, the line of sight. So the, the horizon on the ocean is fifteen nautical miles, right? Okay. Possibly, yeah. Yeah, 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 that Pretty sounds sure right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you don't quite see it. So yeah, you, yeah, for the yeah. first couple of miles, you, you wouldn't see where you, And you wouldn't know where on the where on the coastline. That's why when you're at Dover, you can see France because yeah. it's 14 miles, right? Uh, well, I think it's 80. Oh, maybe. Maybe you can. Maybe from depending on where you are height-wise. From, so at sea level. And also uh, you wouldn't know where on the French coastline exactly for that yeah, distance. No, yeah, yeah, you wouldn't yeah. see like the port that you're aiming at. Yes, you could make miles a, away. a big margin for error there. <laughs> um, and uh, so, yeah, we had the safety boat sort of steer us all the way but um yeah probably one of the easiest because it has to be so flat calm and we actually had dolphins in the first five minutes and a seal and 45 minutes in it got a bit tough about three and a half hours in just because it had just been quite it's just hard work it's just after a while you're like you know paddle one side paddle the other side it's quite slow you're being told to put the beans on for the safety boat because you want to make the that he's, he's trying to navigate you across the busiest shipping channel in the world i can't remember what the figures are but it's hundreds and hundreds of ships go through every day and they move, I think they're restricted to like 20 knots now or something, but 
they, that's fast, much faster than you. Mm. you and it, you wouldn't be able to judge that, judge that on your own. Um, so yeah, it was, I guess, p- the potential for danger was pretty high. But the reality is the conditions have to be pretty uh, calm for you to have a crack at it. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Interesting. I do enjoy paddleboarding, but I wouldn't want to do that far. Last, the, the last year, myself, my missus and another friend called Ash, <coughs> and we did a... How many miles was it? I think we did 30... No, no, it wasn't 30 miles. Oh, it might have been... Thir- do you know, it might have been 30 miles on a canal, though. Nice, yeah. Okay, so dead flat, but long. Yeah, was, was it 13 miles? I think it might have been. And it took us eight hours. <coughs> and, we, and, and it said... Didn't, no, it didn't take us that? eight hours. It didn't take us eight hours. No, no it didn't. Okay. I think it took us six, maybe. But the, the guide... The, when I said the guide, the, 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 um, on, the canal, on the canal route thing... He said, oh, yeah, you can paddleboard it and it'll take three to four hours or something okay. like that. Like, yeah, this would be nice. <laughs> we went out completely Ill- underprepared and uh, it was the hottest day of the year at that point. Yeah. I, in my wisdom, I had brought a thermos flask of coffee and nothing else. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> Classic. Nothing we'll else. be fine. Yeah. Nothing else. Um, yeah, we we just we got about halfway and we were absolutely fucked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. feet were killing us. We got to the yeah. end, we just shattered. We 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 dropped off a car in the I dropped right, off a yeah. car in the morning, so we got there and got back in it. But <clears throat> hardcore, yeah, paddleboarding is, is is on a canal is easy. Yeah, right? it's but the extra. As soon as you get on the ball. ocean, yeah, wow. such did, a great sport. Yeah, it's really fun. I did. I do remember getting the because they had to drive you out to, to get out of the bay at Dungness and they put you in the water. And me and my friend. Um, Charlie, he was doing it. He wanted to do it for the air ambulance, and uh, we got on and we were like, we hadn't actually used these boards before. We'd borrowed them for the crossing. We were like, these are really wobbly, and we were like, and it took us about twenty minutes to get our sea legs. And at which point, you know, you're sort of just trying really hard not to shake and thinking this could go on for six hours. But in the end, we can't. We just calmed down and like he fell in twice. I didn't, just for the record. He didn't fall didn't in fall. at all. No, at all. That is close, impressive. Close, but. He got he got um, annoyed because he thought mine was faster, so he made me swap, and then realised that mine was much smaller, and he's six foot five, <laughs> so, so he just <laughs> the board couldn't hold him. Yeah, good to see. Come back, come back to something you mentioned previously. Tell me what it was like working at the cabinet office. Can you talk about that? Yeah, really fascinating. Um, it was uh, sort of a one-off opportunity uh, with my old unit. Um, they'd helped out during the coronavirus pandemic and they just wanted to maintain that relationship. Or just on like, pl- you know, planning, and extra planning capacity, that kind of thing, because we're in the army, we're good at that. And um, so I got, got a chance, yeah, exactly. Got a chance to go and work for them. And um, yeah, it just really, you get a real sense of purpose. I felt very important clip-clopping from the MOD to the cabinet office, even though I, I was thoroughly bottom of the pecking order um it was really amazing to sort of get that sort of um close-up view of machinery of government where is it in westminster opposite the mod so near right next to the cenotaph okay so like so remembrance day right outside um and uh yeah, there's so much history in Whitehall as well. I'm a bit of a history nerd, secretly. And, you you know, there's, a, there's the Henry VIII wine cellar and the MOD. And there's, like, <coughs> the old Tudor tennis courts inside the cabinet office. There's all this, like, secret history, which the I The Henry VIII wine Wines- cellar. Yep. Tell me about that. In Did the MOD. There? Yeah, I used to go down there all the time. Oh, my God. <laughs> no actual wine down there, just pretend barrels. But... They it's the site of it's the site of Whitehall Palace, um, where Henry VIII or many other monarchs lived, you know, hundreds of years ago. And um yeah, they actually preserved it when they built the MOD and it sits like two floors down. And so you can only go into it if you're a guest or you're a member at the MOD and um they often host like wine and cheese parties down there. <laughs> 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 but it's this big cavernous building and it's actually set up like a little museum. It's really cool. I just found that fascinating. Well, so what else is there, history-wise? Uh, so in the cabinet office, there's, uh, I think it's called the cockpit, uh, which oh. is where, like, I think even Shakespeare, I might have got this wrong, I think Shakespeare had even like performed there. There's like there's a whole model section, there's a whole, an old corridor that leads from the front door of the cabinet office back to the, the cockpit where there's it's like there's an old fireplace and lots of portraits and things. And this is obviously, they've built the, the rest of the modern part of the offices around the historic bits. And there's the old Tudor tennis court, which used to be an indoor tennis court. And there's like old, just they, they just preserve bits of old wall inside the modern um, startup. But there's this cool model in the corridor and it's like, it's the, what Whitehall would have looked like a couple of hundred years ago. 
And it says things like mistress, the king's mistress's chambers and things like that, you know, which I think is quite cool. There's so much history in the UK. Yeah. We take it so much for granted. I think about this when I think about America and I think how young America is. And they've got, I, I th- just because I pay a lot of attention to America at the minute, and they, you know, they, what are they, 1776? Yeah. Literally a couple of hundred years old. Yeah, and we yeah. take it for granted that we have been here since the beginning yeah, of yeah. time. You know, yeah. as soon as, yeah, like... As soon as man, as, human, as soon as Neanderthals made it across, yeah, before, yeah. you know, Homo sapiens made it across here, then this is, yeah. yeah. America wasn't like that. Yeah. Totally different. We got so much, like even just, have you spent much time in Colchester? No, not really. But I'd love to with all the Roman history. Yeah, that's yeah. the thing. I, you know, I, was, I was based there, lived yeah. there. My God, so much. There's like a, I mean, there's a chapel around the corner. I say around the corner, there's a chapel in town. Yeah. And it's like 400 AD. It was Crazy, it's yeah. It's like so fucking old. Like, yeah. it's things that are so old here that we walk past all of the time. Blow, they blow Americans' minds. Yeah. Blow their minds. When was that? Yeah. A thousand BC. And yeah. And it's still here. Yeah. That, that area is where, you know, like in, in Colchester is where Cleopatra surrendered. Yeah. Surrendered. That is nuts. To the, in, you yeah, know, yeah. The, what's the fields there? I can't remember what the fields are called. But, you know, you go, yeah. people go walking their dogs there. So yeah. we well, Westminster Hall. I got <laughs> you get to you can anyone can visit it, but I went in there when I was uh, just after I finished working there, and that's where Charles I had his head chopped off, and you can stand on the spot. I was like, no way. That, I was like, this hall is a thousand years old. It's like eleven. I won't get it wrong. Yeah. Oh my god, I love it. I went out to um, in April. My my youngest wanted to go to Auschwitz. Oh crikey! I know. I know. I'd never been. I've always wanted to go, but yeah. I've also always not wanted to go. Yeah. Um, and she wanted to go out there so we went for four days or five days to Krakow and we did we went to see two main things one was Auschwitz and the camps around and the other one was recommended by a friend who'd been before was the salt mines have you ever been out there? no it's not the you know, top like you said top of your list of holiday destinations it is worth but going, I would love to go it's worth yeah. going just for the salt mines oh, really? when you were talking about the wine cellar and the other yeah. events down there the salt mines in Krakow oh my god you can go down about, I don't know, it's 300, 300 odd meters you can go down in the salt mines and it, they're closed now. They don't, uh, so they're not operational anymore. But these things have been around since the 1800s. And the miners out there who mine this salt and bring it back up, they constructed churches, cathedrals, um, like, yeah, well, the main ones, like church, churches and cathedrals, hundred, like hundreds of meters down underground. But you could go down there and they're as big as. Not St. Paul's, <laughs> but these things are massive and it's all carved out oh, of salt wow. and unbelievably intricate, yeah. like carvings and just un- unreal what they did. But you can go down and have, have events. Oh, wow. oh they've, got a, they've got a massive, like, a, I want to say a restaurant, but it's not a restaurant. It's literally like a, what would you call it? A big, it's a massive hall which they created for when visitors would come to the, to the mine, like the king or whatever would come to the mine and they would... They would host them, have a oh, banquet wow. and stuff, and that's done. You can go down and have weddings, you can have meetings and all. It's like wild venue, wild that venue. That sounds cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we talk about like the history in the UK, but everywhere it's got an yeah, unbelievable yeah, yeah. history. And then you think about the places that are untapped. I know, yeah. History of like in the Amazon. Yeah. And the things that are there. Although I went to, so I've just joined the Royal Geographic Society purely oh, out wow, of interest, okay. and I was on a new members tour recently, and I said to one guy, I was like, what's left to explore? It's so frustrating. Like, I would love to be an explorer (laughs) but i'm like but everyone apart from space or the deep ocean i feel like most things have been covered maybe i'm missing something yeah i think there's some islands haven't been done but i think the ocean's the main one isn't it well no the amazon's a perfect example there's loads of parts out there like yeah i suppose deep deep in the amazon yeah yeah but then i mean you mentioned on the icebreak about space do you know what do you know what the chinese word is for astronaut Oh, I have learnt this in that book. I, I say Chinese it. word, but how are you I learned it in that book, but I can't remember it on top of my head. I hate Taikonaut. It. Yes, Taikonaut. Right, do you know what the Chinese direct, tra- in, their, in the Chinese language. I read language. it, but I can't remember. <laughs> that. I hate, when I, this is what, I've, I'm like a sieve. I'll read a book like that and I think it's really interesting unless I regurgitate it in one ear or out the other. But yes, I, go on, tell me. Universe Explorer. That's the is one. That, was that so what you read? It's along those lines, Universe yeah. Explorer. Yeah. That's what I got told anyway by, uh, I used to work for a, yeah. a company called Blue Abyss. Who were Space Explorer or something, they yeah. They were um, 
the world's first commercial astronaut training centre. So I basically got bombarded with space stuff oh, all wow. the time and around ex-astronauts and things like that. Yeah, Universe Explorer. And I was like, oh my God, nice. that is the <laughs> best job title <laughs> know, ever, so cool. ever. Would you go, uh, if you had a chance, would you go to the moon? If someone else paid for it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I reckon I would. If the opportunity was there, I think I'd say yes. Yeah. I'm not sure I'd go. I'd rather do that than get in a submarine, I think. But yeah. Yeah. Well, I don't know. See, They're both depends as bad who as each made other. The submarine. Yeah. I get in a military submarine. I'm like, yeah, yeah. take me anywhere. In that. Yeah, yeah. Commercially. But I don't know about that one. That What was the name of that one? The, that went um, Titan. 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 Yeah. yeah, that went down. But then the deep sea does fascinate me. Yeah. I, I quite often. I say, yeah, relatively often. I'll go on to YouTube and I look at I look at look for videos of deep sea creatures that yeah. are just wild. And yeah. they are crazy looking things. The ones that never see light apart from when a submarine goes out like yeah. or uh, 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 like yes, a drone. Yeah, they've got like yeah, yeah, yeah. <sighs> that's super things. cool. Yeah. I'm glad that's your weird YouTube niche. Yeah. Well, what's yours? <laughs> what's yours? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> my dad's niche is marching bands it's so sad what yeah yeah that or like weird really out of date comedy I'll just go in there and I'm like what are you watching and there's some like because he's ex-military <laughs> he'll just be like watching some like big brass band, <laughs> military band or something what was the comedy you were talking about oh just something you know from his from his 20s or something you know like I don't, I don't stuff you can't know. get away with now probably yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah goodness mm. me I, I do enjoy I do enjoy history. I do I love I yeah. love reading about it a lot actually. I've just um I've just put into my I, I, into Audible. I've just bought a book on Audible and it's uh, by a lady called I can't remember her name, Myra something. And it's a, it's her account of her experience with Sinn Fein. Oh wow. Yeah, but she was she was sexually assaulted, but she's written this book or and she I think she still lives in Ireland. And it's all about her yeah, insight into Sinn Féin. Basically, oh, wow. I think, I think, this is this morning I found out about this. Yeah. So I've, I've actually reached out to her on Twitter to try and see if she'd be interested in an interview. Because it's all that whole aspect. Like, we we have a, like an understanding of Northern Ireland from mm. ex-military or British person's point yeah. of view. I've actually got Irish family as well. So I've got a little bit more insight yeah. into some of it, but only a surface level. But I'd love to, I'd love to know the inner workings. I'd love to, yeah. like, a big reveal of what actually went on. Yeah. You know, backroom discussions yeah. and secret talks and what actually Sinn Féin were trying to achieve and mm. how the different breakout groups all came yeah. about because there's some crazy stories out there. Yeah, actually, I'm going to a wedding in Ireland later in the year and uh, it's a British girl that I've known since I was born marrying an Irish guy and I know that while they were dating, it was still quite a sensitive subject. So her parents were both ex-military. Her dad was a brigadier in engineers. Mum was a nurse. and But I think it's for a long time, in his family's view, he that her parents were an engineer and a nurse. Didn't even mention oh, the military wow. thing. Yeah. Well, when I joined up, my mother lost close friends when oh, I joined. Really? Yeah, and for, unfortunately, not a lot, but she lost close friends. And like we, we're on the application to join, we have to do all the disclosure for your family. I don't know if yeah. it's the same now, but yeah. then it was. And it took, an, it took a while and we had to omit certain people. Oh, wow. Yeah, because it was... It was like direct IRA links and stuff. Wow. That's just the way it was. You know, like I joined in 2000, you know, in the previous 20 years, that's when it was, all that shit was going down. Yeah. You mm. know, all that shit was going down. I went out to Northern a couple of times, but it was, nothing was going on. It was quiet. Yeah. It was, you know, it was like, what the yeah. fuck? Pretty crap. Yeah. But uh, just before... Can't choose who you're related to either. Mm -hmm. Can't choose who you're related to. No, either. you can't. I've actually got an Irish passport now as well. Oh, cool. Nice. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah. Like when we left the EU, I was like, oh, I need to get an Irish yeah, passport. Yeah, didn't everyone. I, <laughs> yeah. I was like, okay, just make it easier at airports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Where, where did you surf? Where or yeah. when? Where, where? Where, so... Um, so the only major deployment I did was to Nigeria in West Africa. That, that was Interesting. really cool. And probably the highlight of my whole 10-year career because... What were you doing there? When were you in? When were you in Nigeria? When was this? I was in Nigeria in twenty nineteen to twenty, uh, the end of twenty nineteen to early twenty twenty, and then COVID hit. So it was so COVID hit while I was in that Nigeria. Wasn't wasn't twenty nineteen when Mr. Craighead did his thing? Ooh, not sure what you mean. Christian huh? Craighead, the does it does it too? Um, the uh, the, the terrorist attack on the shopping center. Mm, don't think so. I was Nigeria, wasn't it? I was a Kenya. Oh shit. 
Yeah, I'm not sure. So with West Africa, Nigeria. The SES guy who went in and cleared the, cleared the shop. In I think I know what you mean, terror. but I don't remember it being while I was deployed. Hmm. Let's check right, the timelines. Let's have a look. Uh, uh, does it to terrorist attack? Oh, let's have a look online, yeah. Oh, bro, that's, that's two. God's sake. Does, have I misspelled something there? Uh, Christian Craighead, look at that, Craighead. Okay. Sorry, people listening, we're trying to find out, yeah. Okay. Um, oh, Kenya, there you go. Oh, sh- oh that's interesting. He's- yeah, oh, Kenya. Yeah, no, there you I'm go. Other idiot. side of Africa. No, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Kenya, so ignore all that. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, was oh, did I miss time, something I really massive? Yeah. Um, Okay, right, yeah, all right. Got so you. it wasn't, anyway. Um, so going back to West Nigeria. <laughs> what was that like? I've spe- yeah, I love Africa. Yeah, yeah. Love it. So really what was Nigeria cool. like? Amazing. I feel a bit hard done by because COVID hit in the sort of, well, started picking up on COVID. We started picking up on COVID about January. And so about three months into my tour, everything basically got turned off. Shut, everything just shut down. Africa was hot on closing. 2019. So I'm pretty sure deployed in 2019, and then by January, February time of the next year, ah. um, things were sort of picking up, and most of Africa. Just if you looked at if you looked at um, the airspace over Africa, it was just empty because they just. I think there was an awareness that the medical pathways in ma- the majority of, especially the West African countries, or it, from my from what I knew, were they just thought best thing to do is close the air close the airspace. You know, air travel stopped. So um, that meant I was there for a bit longer than planned. I was there for seven seven months rather than six, but it's not much in the grand scheme of things. And unfortunately, the, towards the end of the end of the tour, um, I wasn't able to do any of the things that we'd planned at the beginning of the tour. So all of the sort of training courses and um, any kind of engagements had to be turned off. And so, and it sounds lovely when you're sort of sitting in thirty degrees in a compound with a pool, but anywhere can become a prison when you're trapped mm. there and you're like five how's it five thousand miles away from home and things are kicking off in the UK and you're sort of there not really you can't contribute in any way you can't be there with your family and suddenly you're just stuck there and you're not even being useful you know you're not even doing a job you're just stuck because you're in a really small team in a country that you don't know did Covid hit there while you were there? yeah so it it literally hit and what was their reaction like? what did they do? So it was quite interesting. Um, that, so I was in Abuja mostly, which is the capital city, which is it's kind of a purpose-built city, literally physically in the geographic center of Nigeria. It used to be Lagos, but it was deemed to be sort of discriminatory, discriminatory, I can't say the word, because in general terms, the wealthier pop- part of the population in the south of the country, and it gets poorer the further north you go. So to have the capital city in the south was deemed sort of unfair. So they, I can't remember what year it was, several years ago, Decades ago, they moved the capital city to Abuja. Wow. Um, That's a bold move. Yeah, so right smack bang in the country. And um, and according to the DA, the defence advisor at the time, he said for an African country in West Africa, it's actually really quite well organised. Um, lots of, um, you know, infrastructure, the infrastructure is pretty good. But there's just still a huge disparity between the rich and poor. There'll be this amazing million pound complex and outside there'll be a guy fixing tires on the street sleeping on the street <coughs> corner you know and i remember going for a run one day because you, you have to stay fit and just seeing some guy shitting on the side of the road staring squatting and staring at me oh <laughs> as God. i ran <laughs> as i ran past i was like cool and there's a lot of like tia bruv tia and um <laughs> but yeah absolutely incredible i thought the culture was just amazing they're like so friendly like in a way that puts us to shame i yeah. think um Inviting you to your home, inviting to people to weddings. You know, the, the guys and girls who would work in the same our compounds would sort of invite you to their daughter's wedding. You know, <laughs> it's just just totally bonkers. Um, food's very spicy, <laughs> which I couldn't handle. But well, all, all was it in like, all, all of it in Nigeria? Yeah, just what yes, really? spice. Yeah, they love spice. I, I if it's not that. spicy, it's um, not good enough. <laughs> My first taste of um, no pun intended of uh, of uh, like sub-Saharan Africa was. Uganda. I went out there in 2009. And before that, I'd been to... I'd been to Tunisia on a holiday. And I'd been to... Oh, that was it. I'd only ever, No, I'm sure I'd been to... I was, I'd only ever been to Tunisia, I think. Um, and the same thing. Went to Uganda. And that was... I was I was serving. Yeah. I went to do jungle training. And we 
we came out of the jungle. We had a couple of days. I think we had a night out before we went into the jungle, actually. In, we were in Jinja, J-I-N-J-A. It's, okay. it's spelt, and it's like the back, apparently, the backpacking capital of, of, uh, of Uganda. And it's where, it's one of these must-stop places when people are going through Africa and doing it all. Long story short, remember the first time going into a bar and um, only white faces. Me and, a, me and two others went in there, like obviously the only white faces. And, and um, I don't know, I think, I, I think my, what I perceived that it was going to be like would be sort of similar to being in the Middle East when I've been out there in different, you know, non-white countries where I'm like, this is, and they're not as well off yeah. as other countries. I thought, okay, this, it could be dangerous. You like, don't trust anyone kind of thing. But I was so wrong. Yeah. And because your point, everyone's so friendly. I remember, yeah. I remember we were sitting there and so, there was a guy who happened to be sitting next to me on this bench in this bar in Uganda, in Ginger. And he offered to get our drinks. We already had bought around, and he offered. Yeah. To, he saw you were getting low, and he said, "Do you want me to go and get your drinks for you?" Yeah. And I didn't want to be impolite. I thought, okay, yeah. And I gave him the money. Watched him go to the bar. I knew how much the drinks were because you already bought them. Yeah. And he brought back the drinks. I was think, I was expecting him to short change me or not come back at all. Yeah. And he came back, gave me the change. It was all right. I thought, fucking hell. It was no. He was just yeah. being polite. Yeah. Just, yeah, yeah. And it, it just so, everyone was super friendly, super nice. Now, question: Do you think that? Do you think they're like that with each other? Oh yes, I know. I don't. I I don't know. Maybe it's ingrained. I think. I think I got the impression that it's ingrained that you have to be welcoming. Oh, you know to visitors. better actually because you spent much more time out there than I have. Okay. Well, cool. yeah. I think I. I just get the impression that it's just part of the culture to be welcoming. I'm sure they give each other shit all the time. <laughs> they, in fact, they're quite brutal to each other. They're quite. They're much more direct at telling you know give each other feedback. I think we pussyfoot around our problems quite a lot as individuals British do yeah the British exactly. do for the sure. stiff upper lip so yeah they're probably more direct with each other which is probably healthier what's the main religion out there Christianity, Christianity. and those well in sorry in, in Nigeria it's 50-50 Christian Muslim interesting because the Muslim the Muslim culture obviously enshrined into their yeah. L- yeah, yeah, like yeah. religious law is hey be nice motherfucker yeah yeah <laughs> there's certain things you've got to do it's why the Middle East is so welcoming and pleasant yeah sometimes you yeah. know you're always going to get offered at the home you're always going to get offered chai yeah. you're always going to get offered to a yeah, place yeah. to sit down really really fascinating okay mm. yeah my good but Nigeria. actually one thing I do do remember is that actually being a non-believer is worse than just picking a religion I heard that when I was yeah, serving just yeah just pretend to believe in something otherwise they just they don't get you at all you yeah. are like yeah have a god and they'll respect it but don't have nothing. Yeah, I first got told that when we were getting ready to deploy to Iraq for the Iraq war in 2003, and there was and there was and they were saying, yeah, make you know, just go with something. Have I was a religion christened. on your, on your cool. ID I'm discs. Christian, on, your, you know? on your ID yeah. discs, have a religion. That's better than not. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah. Just make it up. That was quite interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then I guess the other really cool bit of the tour, which was quite um, sort of brought it home, was I had to spend a couple of weeks up in the Lake Chad Basin, up uh, in effectively Boko Haram territory, uh, but purely to sort of cover the. T- I was just going there to cover some the two IC from that section up there who was going on R and R. They just needed needed a warm body to go up there. And um so that was you fly in by civilian ha- at civilian aircraft onto this very unsecure insecure runway in Maduguri in um in northern northeastern Nigeria. And um you're met by armored car and you're immediately strapping on a pistol and I was like, oh shit, there this it's hot here. It's um and you know, then you're in a convoy and it's that convoy came to pick you up, nothing else. They just mm. they came to get you and then you um you get put in an, uh, what what would be considered uh, three, I think three army officers, three Nigerian army officers would live there with their families. It's a tiny little three roomed uh, brick building in the middle of the camp there, um, which was a bit like Rourke's Rift. Like the c- Lieutenant Colonel who was running it, it was only a section of 12 people, Lieutenant Colonel heading it up. Brits. Brits. And um, yeah, he was like this, if shit goes down here, it's Rourke's Drift. And they had like endless amounts of ammunition and weapons and these makeshift sangers on the top of the ISO containers. Thankfully, the situation was reviewed <laughs> during COVID and um, specialised infantry actually ended up going up there afterwards. But uh, it was a case of we were on this camp, which only had a wall halfway around. The Hesco Bastions, was it? Or? Uh, no, so this, the actual house was just a brick house in, in like where the other army officers, other Nigerian army officers and their families would yeah. live. And, um, but yeah, on this camp, which also had like a Mad Max type mechanics area, like Remy. Why'd you say Mad Max? Because honestly, they would like <laughs> weld tanks to <laughs> trucks. I swear to God, we drove past and I was like, what even is that? You know, and, Nigerians would do it. Yeah. 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 That's what they were just, they were making do with what they had. But, um, half the camp was open to the bush and the sort of general uh, intelligence was that 
you know, by day people would be working as sort of, um, you know, janitors or uh, kind of function um, facilities people in the day. And by night they'd be going off to the bush to go and, you know, be terrorists. Um, and so when you're sort of doing your stag duty on the roof, you are quite on edge because you're hearing like you're just hearing all these noises and you're also looking through your night vision and you don't know if that person is just going for a piss or if but because they're going for a piss with their eyeful because that's just standard and they're half cut like they're sort of half in fatigues half not or if that's someone that's an insider threat you know that is weird and it was only for a couple of weeks but it was like the closest I've been because I, I joined sort of at the end of Afghanistan Iraq didn't get to deploy in that area and uh so yeah that's, listening, that's lily yeah that's, uh, <laughs> that's <your dog. laughs> Sorry. Like, i'll kill the terrorists <laughs> you mentioned boko haram yeah 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 <laughs> so um but yeah so amazing really eye-opening and i remember meeting officers of the nigerian army and soldiers and i was like these people have actually seen shit like they've seen way more than i'll ever see mm. but, right um, so what were boko haram or are boko haram trying to achieve brief me up oh god you're going to test my I'm a bit rusty. Well, no, you don't have uh, to do it. pick it. Well, you can get shit wrong, it's all right. <laughs> what I do know is that, it, this is going to be politically sensitive probably, um, that it's in the Nigerian army's interest or defence uh, interest not to solve the problem because unfortunately there is a lot of corruption in Nigeria. So when there's a problem, funding gets put towards the defence sector of which a lot gets scraped off the top. Um, are we talking about uh, are we talking about Nigeria or are we talking about Ukraine <laughs> oh yeah oh, 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 steer away from oh. that one continue <laughs> yeah. continue um, <laughs> but ultimately it's oh no I feel like it gets wrong but it's just regional regional politics so they, they want control basically of of land the, the population um, they, they so want to, were they a political group originally and became terrorist organisation oh you're really testing me here sorry I uh, know I'm, I'm I'm out I would whatever I say I'll get it wrong so I feel, yeah, I'm just rusty now. It's sort of fun. let's listen. Let's Google it. Okay. I'm loving having this other. Laptop I just I'll say it and I'll feel like I'll, I'll say it wrong or Boko Haram. Well, we we're and doing I've, a service to the listeners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We educate the listeners. So there's, Boko there's two Haram, terrorist Nigeria. groups in northern northeast Nigeria, two main ones: okay, Bo- Boko Haram and um, ISIL. Oh, look at this! Love Wikipedia, if it's right. Yeah. So okay. the the reason we were out there initially was because of the kidnapping of the Chibok schoolgirls which was quite famous. There was Remind like um, a quite a large number of, I think you might even say it here. Okay, the Boko Haram insurgency began in July 2009 yeah. when the militant Islamist and jihadist rebel group Boko Haram started yeah. an armed rebellion against the government it's of Against Nigeria. the government and it's religious in The origin. conflict was taking place within the context of long-standing issues of religious violence, love religion, love it, religious violence between Nigeria's Muslim and Christian community. Ah, okay. And the insur- so Boko Haram... And, Predominantly Isla- Islamic, yeah. then. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so the kidnapping, the kidnapping. Where was that? Then? 2015. Here you go. There you Chibok. Go. 1415. There you go. Chibok. On 15th Two, of April. 276. There you go. Yeah. On the 14th of April, 2014, Boko Haram terrorists abducted 276. I vaguely remember this. Yeah, now. it was a big thing. Like female Michelle, pupils. Michelle Obama got involved. There was a, there was a big thing about bring back our girls. It was like hashtag. Who the Dalai Lama? Uh, Michelle Obama. I think she <laughs> but lots of people got involved in this huge sort of social That's media right. outpouring right. to try yeah, and help yeah, get yeah. them back. And I think that the operation I was on was initiated off the back of off the back of that. Ah. Um, it sort of evolved. It's evolved since then. And but. then he kidnapped another eight girls. Jesus, imagine that! All those girls going. Do they get them back? They yeah, Operation Tourist. That's what I was on. Uh, I think uh, s- f- some over time. Yes. Operation Tourist. Okay. Yeah. Some of them, but not all of them. I don't believe so. Oh no. Well, it's been so many. It's been so long now as well. But yeah, what was it's um, and I think. Two hundred and seventy-six. Fuck's sake. Man. Thing is, <laughs> terrorism like this is never going to go away. No. And if it's not religion, that's the, religion that's the excuse. It'll be something else. Yeah. It's never going to go away. Yeah. I say, but I think it's about how you minimise it impact in other countries outside of the one it's in. Yeah, and that's. I think it's hard to get to the British public and get them to understand that just because this isn't directly affecting, it yet, why it's still important that. We try and help. Um, but what, I, what was really interesting, so my job was supposed to be helping with um, alternative means of trying to influence or trying to help the situation. 
And although it had evolved on from the Chibok kidnappings, it was, it was still all about helping to combat viol- violent extremism in northeast Nigeria, and whether that was ISIL or Boko Haram. And it was trying to look at things like how, how can you, you know, identify different target audiences and trying to identify how it's best to communicate with them. Did you say ISIL? Why were ISIL bothered about Nigeria? Is it ISIL? Or I, I think there's ISIS or is it ISIS? It's the same thing. Um, there's different variations. So there's, there's groups in northeast Nigeria as well. Why is that? Because I thought, so ISIL and ISIS, I thought, were all about I'm gonna get the, all bringing, about the, Lev- uh, bringing <laughs> about the, um, the Levant. Levant? Yeah. The Levant, which is, which is not in Africa. Yeah. That's the Middle East. That's that, Iraq. There's, there's, Iraq, Syria, Turkey. Yeah, no, there's definitely factions uh, in really? Africa as well. Yeah. And just pick up on the, on the Islamic ideology. Um, Interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah, there's like a huge net. You, there's probably, there's a, probably, oh, I feel like you can did, probably I find it. it. Like there's a whole network um, of different factions of Islamic State. And they're so, they've got different statuses of relationship between each other, which I couldn't read off the top of my head right now. I'd have to look it up. Weren't AQ out there for a while? Possibly, but not. There wasn't something that we were operating. We were sort of working mm. with, but um, it was all about yes. Yeah, so it's all about um, trying to think about alternative way, means of influencing people. Um, so, and in Nigeria, a lot of that is people are the literacy rate is quite low. So a lot of communication is done by um, local, like local religious leaders, um, <coughs> music, dance, plays. So we got to uh, work alongside some NGOs in terms of trying to educate people on. Um, how to how to resist sort of being recruited into these organisations because some of the biggest problems was that actually they paid pretty damn well and they fed you and they clothed you so that's your option and, and there's structure and there's discipline yeah, structure and discipline. There's protection that might be the only authority you've seen as a young kid in your entire life because you're so far away from it's a lot like Afghan sounds a lot yeah. like Afghan with the Taliban you know for all the people that I found it really bad, a lot of people, it was really good that they were ruling. Yeah. I'm not saying that no. the Taliban are good. I'm just saying like, it was a better Job option security. than not. Yeah. You know. Um, uh, what was I going to ask you then? So I love, I love the topic of influencing people. I love it. Like the, that behavioral... Science. Science yeah. almost. Yeah. Yeah, I've, so when I was serving, I was very lucky to go and do the psychological... Operational Psyops. operations planner course, course yeah. military science plan. Yeah, I was I was deploying to Afghan in a int role, um, but I was I was like put into that role quite late on, right? And missed the boat on the the bog standard int course that was available to yeah. power edge guys power edge guys at the time, and there happened to be a space left on the science planning course, which was for captain, major, and above. Yeah. So and just like me, bumfuck, <laughs> Sergeant Keir on, on this. And there, there happens to be one other, there was one other guy in it who was a senior NCO, a non, you know, not, uh, non-commissioned. And he was a flight sergeant from the RAF. And that was interesting because he had been one of the, he had, he had accompanied the weapons inspectors to Iraq pre-Iraq invasion 2003 to go and do the WMD inspections. Oh, wow. He went out with the, the UN inspectors to protect them onto the site. That was a fascinating I bet. Yeah, I bet. That was a fascinating... <laughs> like, there was no inspecting getting done there no, whatsoever. Oh, He's oh, like, mate, we didn't do anything. Um, but back onto it. Yeah, the subject of influencing people because it's such... It, it has applications everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Like, that stuff you learn in a military aspect, absolutely applicable in the civilian aspect. Yeah, Everything yeah. It, it's, it's influence. Have you and, heard of... Cal- I'm guessing you heard of Caldini's... Uh, six forms of influence. No. If you're not, you're like that. Go check on, it, tell check me. It out. So there are six ways, supposedly. I mean, I've I tried to do this to my ex boyfriend, didn't work. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> there are six ways. So um, that you're supposed to, powers. That's it. Six powers of persuasion. How you can. Uh, um, and it's to do with. Um, yes, I'm trying to remember the six. So reciprocity. So if you give something to someone, they're more likely to give you something back. Social proof. So if it's sort of um, mutually agreed, or uh, what's the word? Agreed by a group of people, you're more likely to agree. Um, I'm going to, you might have to Google the rest cool. of them. Um, Six powers of persuasion. Yeah, uh, yeah. Caldini's powers of persuasion. I oh, can't see it. Can I can have them on top of my head. Oh, you got reciprocity. Reciprocity. Sc- scarcity. Scarcity. Yes, yeah, so it makes something rare, and people are going to want it more. Like, oh, there's only five new iPhones. Yeah. You know, I'm going to get it. What else? Authority. Authority. Yeah. So that's an easy one. I'm in charge. Do what you're told. Uh, it's kind of on the screen right now. Come on, raise it. There it is. Yeah, reciprocity, scarcity, authority, commitment and consistency. So talk about the authority one. 
it's authority. Well, yeah, that's that's more sort of like if you tell them to do something. Yeah, tell them to do okay. something, you'll do it if that authority is respected, of course. Hang on, sorry, going back, like scarcity. Say because when you were talking through that, I was googling. Yeah, was sure. Listening. Okay, go from the beginning. So reciprocity, easy. Uh, I give you something, you're yeah. more likely to give something yeah. back. So that could, and that doesn't have to be goods. It can be oh, I've given you some information, vice versa. You give it back. Scarcity. If you make something rare, people are more likely to want it. It's like that's how sales tactics work, and a lot of this is transferable into the marketing world. Authority. If someone's in a position of recognised authority or power, you're more likely to do what you're told. Teacher, officer, supposedly yeah. <laughs> senior senior NCO. Let's say. Um, <laughs> Commitment and consistency, you know, if you are loyal to the cause, you're more likely to do something. Social proof, if if you want to fit in with your tribe, you're going to go along with what the general consensus is. And liking, if someone likes you, and that links quite closely to a lot of the other ones, to the reciprocity, they're more likely to do what you ask them to do or give them what you want. So if you can, if you can apply all of those to, like, a, you can use this in marketing, and you can use this in, I don't know, getting someone, I don't know, on board for a podcast. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you know, say, so, oh, there's only one spot left on my podcast series. I did not use it on you. No, no. <laughs> um, I feel like I've learned these on that course and forgotten them. Yeah, yeah. So who is who is uh, Kildini? Professor, uh, so, uh, psychology professor. It's quite an old uh, um, reference now, I think, but quite famous in this world. That makes sense, though. Yeah, I think it's just sort of clarif- like really laying out you know the the means you have to influence and i don't think you have you have to be very machiavellian about it you can you can just be like well you know i should also like you but it helps that i also need something from you you know mm, um yeah but. on that on that course they had some guest speakers in and i there was t- i wish i could remember the detail of what they were talking about but one of them was there was two of them one of them was a civil servant and I think they're both civil servants, actually. And one of them was responsible, had been responsible for um, persuading the British media that invading Iraq was a good idea. Not persuading the public, oh, God. persuading the British media. Yeah. No such thing as public opinion, published no. published opinion. Yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. exactly. And uh, he was talking, like he went into detail about how they planned the first, the, the press conference, the first press conference from the, the First time they were bringing the press in, what they did before the actual press conference happened, everything leading up to it, this this persuasion, this you know psychological um, influence on them before they turned up. Like, just, well, you know, it's just sub, subliminal things, things yeah. they wouldn't even notice. Oh, yeah, yeah. To get them on side, that was yeah, the, yeah. that was a gentleman who did that, and he was. I wish you could remember. They were fucking fascinating. And then the, another person who came and spoke, and she worked for the government at the time. And she had been given, I think it was in the late 90s or the early noughties. So I did this course in, what would have been 09. 09, I think I did it. And, no, 2010. And she had had the responsibility for leading a campaign, again, not against, targeting the British public, but targeting uh, women who were most likely to be teenage teenage pregnancies to, oh, wow. yeah, yeah because yeah. there was a i don't remember but there was a, apparently a big teenage pregnancy epidemic at some point late 90s early 90s yeah and she talked through how they went about that campaign like yeah from who, how do we work out who we want to target because the obvious answer is well you want to target the girl you want to target young girls yeah but they're not yeah, yeah but yeah. you break that down but, and they're not also they're not the only ones yeah it's like Parents, yeah, boyfriends, it goes back to target school audiences. teachers. It might not it's, be who you think it's going to yeah, be. Yeah, peers, not just you know. It's, it's, yeah, it was incredible to listen yeah, to. Incredible yeah. to listen to. Well, you could you could prime people in here if you wanted. Um, you could put things on the walls that made them think a certain way. Even if you wanted them to relax more, you could put like relaxing messaging on the board That's walls. Go- well, what about this one from Jenny McGill? There you go. Hope. Hope is the mother of all men. Or is that a bit on- ominous? No, I like that. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, Aliness saves lives. I prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> do you know do you know that term comes from no i don't actually it's uh colonel tootle so okay. colonel tootle was the uh, co of three para oh, in 2006 right. uh, at the time of that tour yep. and he was the first one who said it so uh, you know Ali and, <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and he said um, he literally said it on a he said it in a brief to, I think it was all the script. I can't remember. What it, was. It, was a, it was a brief, and then he repeatedly said it in briefs. Was, no, mission briefs. And then he said it once. It was public. It was like on a 
He was on an interview or something. I can't remember what it was on, but he said it publicly. And it was like fucking earlier. Ali Nassir's lives. Ali Nassir's yeah. lives. Everyone loved it. I think it's true because if someone feels like they're like a rock star, they'll. If you feel like you're hyped up and you're in it because you feel like you're well, Ali. Well, that depends on your definition of Ali Nassir, okay. right? Because <laughs> yeah. people who are not. Not Ali. Well, no. Because I think people who don't. Uh, who aren't power edge, right? And ingrained okay. with the understanding of yeah. Ali Ness, Okay. They think a different thing. Okay. Well, what's your thing? <laughs> You've gone right. <laughs> oh God, no! I wrote I've a big article on this. Did you? Yeah, oh, okay. it's very popular. It the definition of aliness. Okay. So, what's your what's your um? Uh, big shit hot at what you do, but like looking the part as well, <laughs> like looking what you, like you know what you're doing and being good at it. it no, it's no? not. It's not to no? do. Uh, it's not necessarily to do with what you do. Okay. Right. So. I don't know if that's a good. Look at this. Here's my this one. This goes viral at least once a year. All right, let's bring it up. Yeah, click so like to do that. looking looking hot, but in a I guess it's efficiency, isn't yeah, it? It's the efficiency. It the, here we go. Right, here we go. The definition. I'm very proud of this. Took me took me a while. Oh, fair uh, enough. It's quite lengthy. I'm not going to go through it all. But but it's it's basically mo- it's. it's oh, like, I'm with you now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Origin of Ali. Be shit hot of stuff. Origin right? of Ali. Yeah. Ali. The evolution of Ali. <laughs> I love it. I went this is such this. a power register. <laughs> <laughs> this is like. Jesus yeah, Christ. I know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Alina saves lives. The phrase Alina saves lives pay homage, pays homage to one of the early meanings of the word and the belief that choosing function, function and, and efficiency, efficiency of yeah, okay. clothing over simply looking smart improves the efficiency of a unit, okay, making it. them a better... Because this is impressive. That's what I mean by shit hot. Mate. That's way more academic <laughs> than... Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but people think Ali is just trying to look cool. No, it's not. No. It's not. Like... No. But, it's, you know, issue kit can sit. It's oh, it's 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 good up to a point. Yeah. But you can definitely improve it. There's oh, better definitely. boots you can buy. There's modifications yeah. you can make yeah, to kit. Yeah, yeah. All of that stuff. Yeah. But don't do it because it looks cool. Yeah. Do it because it improves how good a soldier you are, yeah, or yeah. sailor, or air woman, yeah, or yeah. air man. Yeah, yeah. Air man. You're air getting man. all woke on me now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's Ali. How do we get on? How do we get on to Ali? Um, we're talking about influencing, but. And we're talking about how you could prime someone. And I just wanted to say before I forget, if you've not watched the Darren Brown video with Simon Pegg, um, it's a really good one to understand priming. So Darren Brown basically persuaded Simon Pegg that he wanted a BMX bike when he didn't. You have to watch the video to understand. Darren Brown. But it's really cool. Well, in short, I don't want to spoil it, but okay, caveat, don't if you don't want to, um, you don't want to spoil it skip ahead um but basically uh you get simon Pegg to write down a piece of paper before like a few weeks before they meet what would you want for christmas if you could have anything in the world what would you write and he writes down a leather jacket folds it up puts it signs it seals it puts it in his wallet simon Pegg does simon this. Pegg, yeah the yeah. actor comedian and he puts it in his wallet and leaves it there for weeks comes to meet simon Pegg, and you watch the video you watch it happen from start to finish and um by the end simon uh darren brown says right what do you want what did you what do you want for christmas and he went i want a bmx bike and he opens the, and he opens it and he's like holy shit and he's got leather jacket written down and throughout the whole course of that interview that conversation Darren Brown is changing his mind so his influence is priming him and things like there are BMX type shapes on the walls around the room he uses like uh, X he uses the the way he uses his language was like I can't replicate basically he influences him in such a way that he he honestly believes that he wrote down BMX bike in that on that piece of paper. F- oh, he'd forgotten he'd written leather jacket. Yeah, yeah, he wow. totally he totally believed. He was like I, I that's not what I wrote. And oh he 100% my god! Raised it. I feel like Darren Brown has no chance holding down a relationship. <laughs> it's like I couldn't, I yeah. couldn't have, a, I couldn't have. Not that I want another relationship. I love my fiance very much. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't have a relationship with like a someone like that. Yeah. So I'd be constantly thinking. Are they manipulating uh, me? Yeah. Am I here because I wanted to be here, or because you want me to be here? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like what's yeah, going yeah, yeah. on? Yeah. Have you seen the? What? He's amazing. I, I should watch more of his stuff. Actually, have you seen? I assume you've watched a lot of his stuff. Uh, sort of off the back of that, you, you know, you go down your YouTube. Holes. Have you seen the one where he he says he will he will engineer it so that a person will bet on horse races and win ten times in a row at ten different races? Have you seen that? No, but I want to be that person. Oh my <laughs> god! So you watch the you watch the you watch the program and basically start as I recall, it starts off and this. He says to this person, right, you're going to go in. I'm going to, I'm, you go and put a bet on a horse, uh, any horse you want. And 
I guarantee you that you're going to win, right? But the ca- the caveat is when you win that money, you have to put it on another bet. Oh, wow. On another horse and, a- and another race I'm going to tell you to go to. And you have to do it 10 times. So this person wins 10 oh times God. and every time he's winning you know it's like thousands yeah. and th- at the end it's thousands Jesus, and thousands of that and they win yeah. 10 times and it's at different races it can't possibly be set up he's not paying off the jockeys he's not drug yeah, yeah, he's yeah. like how the fuck do you do that and the program's about how he did it right it's all probability okay so he worked out the probability of the a person being able to do that and it was something in the vicinity y'all I'm going to pull a number out of my ass 500,000 to one Jesus. half a minute to yeah, one yeah. right so what they did was this is before the program made yeah they had a campaign to f- to get they and they told people you're going to take part in a, in a tv series in a, in a competition and you're going to win 10 times on the horses and they get half a million people to take part uh, each time uh, okay. so they got half a million people in race one Got it. I was going to say they've had to do this multiple times. Yeah, a load okay. of them lose, a load of them pass, a load of them go on to the next. So they win the first one. They go, oh my god, I won, yeah. and they told me I was going to win. But the ones that didn't win, like you fucking talking shit. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Like they didn't win. Yeah. You know, they get. I think they, maybe they got the money, but I don't yeah, know. Something right. Like that. The rest go on to it, and slowly but surely, you get like the ninth race is only like a few of them left. They don't know about each other. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. don't know. Oh, wow. They think they're the only one. Oh, wow. Right. And they get to the last race, and only one of them wins. And they okay. don't know they're there. Yeah, so yeah, one yeah. person has won 10 times and they've been told it's going to happen and they're like holy fuck so when they <laughs> when they show this at the start of the program all yeah. you see is that one person won 10 times yeah, it's yeah, amazing it's that amazing. is very cool it is amazing cool. He's, he is a fantastic yeah fantastic yeah I'm going to watch more now right, but it's the same with magicians right because mm. magicians are the same thing yeah it's like part it's sleight yeah. of hand but part of it is yeah where they want you to look yeah. and not yeah, look yeah. I wish I was that clever. <laughs> yeah, it's, well, I say that I know some solid magicians. <laughs> <laughs> I say I know some. I may or may not know one. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> man of no, many, I say man so. Of I don't say solid. They just they're quirky. I don't mean solid. Oh, okay. They're quirky, aren't they? Oh, okay. They're quirky. Yeah, yeah. They just yeah. They, you have to be a different kind of human to operate at yeah. that level of discipline. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> what's your What's your hobby? My hobby, oh, adventures. Um, yeah, play that's the an excellent segue into your I, adventures. Yeah, I know. I play a lot. I play the guitar badly. Uh, have a dog, and I'm always doing. I always want to be. I want to be good at stuff. That's my thing. I want to be. I want to be. I want to be like. Oh, I just want to be able to apply myself to most things and be all right at it. You know, like the, mostly. I think that's a physical thing, like that's derived from being in the military and physical. Physical robustness has always been a part of who I am and what I want to maintain going forward. Were you adventurous before you joined the military? um yes i guess so but i never really thought about it i just mum and dad you know they'd taken us on lots of cool family holidays um i sort of wrote something down recently i do a bit of journaling and i was like they they uh could have sent me to a really fancy school if they'd wanted i'm sure but i'm so glad they didn't because we spent that money on nice holidays that we, we left the country and experienced other cultures and things and that i think got me excited i yeah, I had a I had an uncle. I have I do have an uncle who was special forces, so that was a big inspiration. I should have said him at the beginning. Actually, I think that always spiked oh, the my interest. Yeah. Questions, yeah. Um. So he was SAS and SBS, and I think Ali. That's yeah, Ali. There you go. That's Ali. Um. And I think he definitely set the bar in terms of like what was what robust looks like. SAS and SBS. Yeah. It's He's a which one first? Grumpy Uncle Johnny, but actually annoyingly quite good at his what he did. <laughs> uh, so, oh God, this is like before I joined the army. So, is his is his story public? Uh, poss- I don't know. Okay. Probably not. Probably not. Um, but yeah, just just impressive in terms of what he achieved. He was eight years younger than my dad, so he was like my cool young youngish uncle. Um, so that definitely, you know, he was always like, what you know what you're going to do that's exciting and, and you know if, how's the running going and um sort of encouraged me alongside my parents to be fit and healthy and active and I think that probably evolved dad encouraged me to join the cadets at university and then I thought this was great I'm getting paid to do adventurous stuff so I joined the army mostly through lack of um I think uh inspiration as to what to do with my life so I just you fell into joined as an officer right yeah yeah so did went, you go to uni went to university first yeah and you're saying you're not academic yeah, but I did geography. I did six hours of tuition a week. That was it. I just had a great time the rest of the time. You did yeah. six hours. Six hours. I'm so glad I didn't pay what they pay now. It's like it was a third. For how long? Three years. 
Six hours a week. For three years, on average. And you got a degree for that? Yep. I mean, I'm not... Look at it. I scraped a 2-1. Oh, I know. I scraped a 2-1. <laughs> yeah. Jesus. Yeah, yeah. I failed on my modules and scraped a 2-1 by... Did point, you? 0.2 points. <laughs> I was like, yeah, but do you know what? All the mugs who like, worked harder and still were going to get a 2-1. I was like, who's a mug? Oh, my God. Why um, is it only six hours a week? Because you're supposed to do a lot more studying and I didn't... <laughs> I think that's that's, oh. that's six hours of tuition, that's six hours of lectures, and you're supposed to do like lots of self study. Is that kind of the average for uni courses? I think for a huma- humanity uh, humanities course, maybe like, if you do like physics. Sorry, the dog's scrap- no, that's right, that's scratching right. me. Lily, what scratching at? Go on. Uh, if you if you do physics or a science based one, you're probably going to do a lot more or technology. But humanities, you're sort of supposed to go off and and do your own re- reading, or you when you go you do go on. Um, on uh, field trips, then that, that's obviously full time, and you go and do your research and collect samples or whatever. Um, and then you're supposed to come back and spend hours doing coursework. But you're at university; you have a great time. I learned how to be a, how to be an adult at university. Like, how to feed myself. And <laughs> where did you? Where was it? Southampton. Okay. So not didn't go very very far afield, uh, but it was great. And they had a great um, officer cadet force, and uh, that you know that introduced me to like cross country skiing and you know green skills and i found myself enjoying it like i just loved it, it was, you, you know. officers are a different i breed. know we're weird aren't we different breed. <laughs> what, what, um was that your first experience with them oh, apart from your parents parents obviously. but they weren't while i was born i was never a pad brat or anything like that no so, so. you so officer cadets were your first, first thing so when i was 18 19, 19 years old yeah. why did you why did you end up joining that then? just dad my dad was like he encouraged me he said i think you'll i think you'll enjoy it i think he must have picked up on the fact that i been on like some sailing expeditions like I'd, I'd chosen to go on like sailing expeditions or I'd chosen to go to Belize when I was 18 with uni no no off the, my own back so oh, nice. I went to Belize for five weeks with like a trek trek force thing, like a you know a youth youth trip to the jungle and I was like this is this is epic I get to wield a machete for five weeks and chop trees down and do you know a bit of eco- ecology type stuff and I think that's why I was like geography army officer sort of blends um, I, th- I think international travel is one of the most important yeah. things that young young people can do for their own development. Yeah, or parents can do to encourage them to do. Yeah, just yeah. get out and travel. Like yeah. the the most I don't know, I feel like not the most accomplished, but sort of the most worldly, sensible, down to earth people I meet are ones who have travelled from young had the opportunity to travel from a young age. Not necessarily been constantly travelling, but they've you know, they've been at different places when they were young. Yeah. And not <clears throat> you know, not bog standard holiday somewhere you know every year or whatever they, yeah they've they've experience. seen different cultures yeah, yeah. And, and and experienced different languages and different people and yeah. different climates yeah you know I, I, yeah it's... i have um i think i have two points on that one is definitely when i was 18 i was in the middle or 17 18 in the middle of the belize jungle and i like remember landing on the runway in the middle of nowhere and like burst into tears because i was like where am i and i just got off this rickety aircraft in the middle of nowhere like that's the furthest i've ever been from home and then those five weeks later, I was like, that was the most formative experience of my life. You know, being there by myself with a bunch of, like the age range there was mental. There was everyone from 17 to in their 40s, people getting, and often they were getting over like trauma, which I think links into doing adventures. But some people were getting over like a drug addiction. Someone was getting over the death of a mother. Someone was getting over a divorce. And people, so how was it organized? This was a company you could just sign up to. It's Trek, a company called Trek Force, um, and they did co- expeditions all over the world, and anyone could sign up. Um, and um, I remember being like, "Am I on this? Who am I on this trip with? Like, I'm not coming here from like from a place of trauma." But actually, it was really interesting to hear all these people that stories I never would have met had I not left or joined this um, this trip. And yeah, I think it was four weeks in the jungle and a week in on an island somewhere where they were diving or whatever. But um, yeah, it was just amazing to feel so remote and we had a Belize Defence Force guy with us because we were on the board near the border with Guatemala <coughs> and so there's quite a lot of smuggling and um you could hear like the horns of the smugglers in the in the night when you're sleeping in your hammocks. The horns? They, so they used to use horns to like I think it's horns to communicate with each other. I didn't know that. Uh something like that. And um and I remember hearing them in lying in your hammock in the dark and you're like, Oh my god And you're like when you're eighteen years old, that's terrifying and you can hear like rustling in the bushes and you there's like poison ants and snakes and, you, like, you and know. the jungle's a wild yeah. place to be isn't it yeah and, wild uh, place to be. yeah that was that was pretty cool and so it was a sort of my dad was like we well, love that so join the cadets and i think yeah like i said lack of imagination didn't know what else to do so join the army <laughs> <laughs> and i was total mug because i didn't go for the 
but you can get a bursary if you go through get get the army to pay for university but yeah. i held off and held off because i was like oh do i really want to do that and then by the end i said any chance i can get a bursary and they were like on your bike <laughs> <laughs> it was too late too late yeah 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 oh my god well um what did the did the officer cadets actually set you up well for uni or not? Uh, or for, for the army or not? I actually, don't get me wrong. There's, there was plenty of drinking and plenty of parties, but they do put you through your modules. I don't know what they what they are now, but they teach you. And and I have to say, when I got to Sandhurst, my first term was a lot easier for me than people who had never touched. Mm. Like I knew how to iron my uniform. You know, the first month or so is about like this is how you iron your uniform, this is how you polish your shoes, this is the language. March. Exactly, the same March. And I, d- I learnt that to a reasonable stand. You know, re- I was a cadet, let's be honest. But it, it gave me a head start, definitely. Um, and it's more, they don't care, the officer training corps, if you join the army or not. They, they're trying to just produce leaders across the board. They're trying to, ins- oh, really? they, don't, they don't mind that. Yes, of course, it's a, it's a recruitment pipeline, but they don't mind that people go off into industry but, because then they have an appreciation of the military elsewhere in, in, in the UK yeah, in industry. Yeah, like advocates. Yeah, advocates for the military. And now if you look at the armed, um, what's it, the, the scheme, the Armed Forces Covenant. Yeah. So lots of people will say, oh, I used to be in the, used to be in the officer training corps or I used to be in cadets or, and they've never touched the mainstream military, but they have an appreciation and that's sort of part of the aim of these and you've got the employer recognition scheme as well exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Ah, interesting so cool. did uh, how did you find sandhurst how did that stack up for you i always say it was the best and hardest year of my what life what year did you go 2012 jan to, fe- jan to december any power edge there officers uh, 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 instructors oh instructors do you know what it's a blur 20, 20, 10 years in fact you're going out on a limb because i this is interesting <laughs> this is interesting so i was supposed to be there in 2012 okay yeah one of the reasons i left the military, one of the reasons that tipped me over the edge is they wanted to send me to Sanders as an instructor. Um, I didn't want to go. I want to go to Brecon. Right. An instructing Brecon. Real army, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to go. You know, the other thing with Sanders is um, at the time I was married. And it's full on. Like, yeah, and, no and time. For instructors, so I went down and spent some time down there. Like, he did like a look at life, look at instructor life, and I spent time talking to the guys who were down there, power edge instructors who were down there. And they said that of the instructors who go to Sanders and they and they don't bring their family with them. So the family stay in the, in the, in the house or wherever. The time I was in Colchester, and they don't. The, the divorce rate is 70%. 70%. Yeah. And there was a housing, well, there always is a housing shortage down yeah. there. And like the, the nearest pub we would have got was like seven. I mean, the irony is I got fucking divorced anyway, like oh. six years later. But if I had gone down that path, so I would have been, I would have gone to Sandhurst in 2011 if I passed the instructor selection. 2011, I would have been, I would have been there yeah. with you there. This would have but been I ter- wasn't. I would have been terrified Lucky to come you. back. <laughs> yeah, but, they, so. but the, there was no power. Uh, there may no, not have been any power edge there. It was a massive issue. Power edge didn't want to go there. Uh, we had um, a lot of Scottish uh, regiment. Uh, um, yeah, my CSM and all, all three colour sergeants were Scottish. We couldn't understand the word they said. Uh, the, <laughs> accent, the accents were so strong. We were, we were like, what did, what did he just ask us to do? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, it's an inter- I mean, talk about history. There's history there. Oh, yeah. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Wow. Um, but yeah, hardest, hardest year of my life, but just so... Was it really? So formative. Well, I think it's just hard physically, and but I, lo- I loved it because you don't think about anything else. I think it's probably the same in any kind of training. You are, you know, you're fed, you're watered, you're clothed, you've got somewhere to sleep at the end of the night, whether that's a basher or a bedroom, and your world is your, your section or your platoon, and... The, the color sergeant is God and you know, you just don't have to, nothing exists outside those walls and you just, you focus, you get to focus on your own development. That's one of the things I miss about the military. Yeah. And I know you, you know, you're doing your challenges last year for, to, re, to raise money and awareness yeah. and to support mental health charities and things. Yeah. Right. And one of the things I miss about the military and I think why a lot, a lot, yeah, may, maybe a reason a lot of people are struggling to come out is that's so wildly different. Mm. All of a sudden, all those control measures and guardrails that you have and worries that you don't have are now all present. You don't have to worry about anything else. You don't have to worry about, you know, for most for most non-commissioned personnel, probably the most who are serving now, most of them will be living on camp or in yeah. FIA. Most of them will be feeding themselves at the cookhouse. Most of them will have minimal bills they have to worry about like 
phone bill. Yeah, phone Xbox bill. Xbox 360 fuel. subscription. Yeah. Fuel, car insurance, nothing else. Now, when you leave, yeah. if that's the only thing you've known since you were yep. a kid and you leave, you go, oh my God. That's growing yeah. up. You go, oh my God. Yeah. You don't realise the package that you're on either. I, like, what do you mean? I have to yeah. pay for the dentist. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I put that off so far. <laughs> I yeah. should really go. But do you know what? I still can't get my head now. I, like bank holidays. Yeah. And leave. I, yeah, I've got I've got loads of annual leave. I always end up every year with annual leave. Because I've only been really in a proper civvy job in a, for about three years. Yeah. Before that was like all over the place doing different shit. Bank holidays, like... All civilians who have been civilians for a long time know where the bank holidays are. They know it because they've yeah, had, they've had like, bank holidays what? all their life. We used to work them. I haven't got a clue <laughs> where they are. I haven't got a clue where they are. And, and, and you'll leave. Yeah. You know, silly things. like it was. You get told when you're having your leave. Yeah, yeah, you don't yeah. get an option to do that. Yeah. And heaven forbid trying to book a holiday when you get put on guard. Yeah. You're losing the holiday. Whereas now you're like, I can take leave whenever I want. <laughs> I know, okay, I know. Well, I'm going to do know. that. We've been yeah. taken up. So my company in Mars has been taken over by, um, we've been bought by another company called Viasat, an American company. Viasat, doesn't even have an annual leave policy. Ooh. Check that out. Unlimited. They're, unlimited. They're like, wow. you take leave when you want to take leave. I would not be good there. Like, what? Yeah, but <laughs> you know what they've found and companies do this found. People don't do it. Yeah, people take less leave. Oh, wow. Yeah, take less leave. I'm like, there's a quota there. That's an aiming mark. Well, I'm going to go. Well, if there's no quota, people take less leave. They just <laughs> oh, take it when they need okay. it. It's supposed to. But look at me, for example. I think I've got two and a half weeks I need to take at the end of the year. I oh, crank it, yeah. Yeah, but, uh, but that means I haven't needed it the rest yeah. of the year. And I certainly don't need it now. Yeah. Well, or maybe a week at Christmas. But <laughs> it's interesting, isn't yeah, it? Those, yeah, yeah. The old uh, woke, woke, re progressive uh, We like policies. it. It works for like We it? like some parts of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Well, um, artillery, what was your second choice of unit? Or was that your second choice? Uh, I was torn between the engineers and the artillery. Because at the time, women weren't, you weren't allowed to join the infantry or the armoured corps. That's, no, that's a change. The good old days. The good old days. <laughs> <laughs> Joking, uh, I'm joking. I think I would have. You're going to hate me. I think I would have gone for the armoured corps if um, I'd had the option. Why would I hate you? Because you're, inf you're infantry. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Judge me. I'm not infantry, mate. I'm power rash. <laughs> right. Okay, sorry, sorry. Um, but yeah, I, I think <laughs> I would have. Because I ultimately joined the army because I wanted to be in the army. I didn't really think about what it is I wanted to do in the army. And my experience had been a cadet, you know, with the, which is very basic. And so I realised my mistake too late on because other people had really thought ahead as to what they wanted to do whether they wanted to specialize in signals or intelligence or and i was like oh, i don't know i just want to like do army and <laughs> and um so it got to like choosing a cat badge and i said to my dad who was an engineer what should i pick and he was like well you know what? i'm i'm not gonna, you know what i'm gonna say i was like great you're useless and um Honestly, 50-50, and I, I still question that to this day because I think it comes down to personalities and where you fit in, and I think I could have hopefully fitted in either. Um, I think the engineers might have been better in terms of being deployed in more peace times because I think I sort of left. I joined at the end of Afghanistan. We weren't blowing shit up as much. So when I joined the gunners, not, not many. I think there's one gunner regiment still deploying uh, from, from an armoured gunnery perspective. There was some I-Star and sent some Warn, but nothing particularly punchy. And whereas the engineers will get deployed to hurricane relief uh, operations and things like that that are peacetime orientated as well. So it might have worked better for the period that I was in the military. Question for you. Yeah. What is the rest of the Royal Artillery's perception of 7RJ? <laughs> Mixed, can I say? Uh well, there was... Oh, I'll get into trouble, won't I, if I say anything <laughs> at this point. <laughs> Just asking the question. Uh, I feel like there was a naughty battery in 7RHA. That was that was the thing. And they were the battery. I don't, I don't, I'll say the wrong letter. But um, they How were... How many batteries are there? Oh, God, How much size is a battery? A battery A battery is a company. Okay, right. So, uh, company I size. thought it was company sized. I thought it was battery sized, 7RHA. Seven, oh, God, I don't know. I, I was never in 7RHA. Uh... I, th I don't know size wise. I may be wrong. I've got yeah, there must be more. Well, there must be more than one battery, uh, more com more than one company, because there was a naughty company supposedly, and they were the one that sort of overshot Salisbury Plain and landed, you know, uh, ended up in a farmer's field. They were the ones that had some sort of dodgy overshot, as in with artillery. Yeah. Holy shit! When yeah, was that? Yeah. Oh, several years ago. There was. I think it was sort of hushed up. And here's some money, Mr. Farmer. <laughs> oh my god! Can you imagine that? Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, so farmer's like, oh, there's a great big hole in my field. Um, and that, that potentially, you know, there was... I got blown up by 7 RHA in Afghan. Oh, really? Oh, although God. they denied it. Oh, okay. Yeah, they totally denied it. Yeah, they said it was an uh, airburst from a Taliban. Well, I was on a roof in... 
was on the roof in um, uh, Muscala and there was a bunch of, it, was, it was in the middle of a, uh, of a contact in the middle of a tick and they'd been banned from firing over troops heads uh, earlier in the tour because they'd dropped one short into the Sangin DC like in the middle of Sangin where which was the compound we occupied there by, by British forces and they dropped one short and landed in well, like I said, the courtyard, the open area, no one had been killed, like, or injured, like, fucking Jesus. They got banned for final people's heads. I don't yeah. know what was going on. Maybe it was a naughty battery. Maybe they had some, maybe at the time, it was just, they had some morons in command. It happens. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and, as in Muscala, we had shit going down, and they were in the, in the desert. And they, we called them in, they got authorization to fire over heads, and they did. And it was a three round, salvo it's that if that's the right yeah. terminology and uh, we heard the first one coming we're like fucking hell whistling it yeah yeah like fucking hell this is this is close because where the target was was close but it wasn't that close it was we're talking maybe it might have been i reckon 200 meters if i remember what the target was where we were calling it on first one came in second one came in i was like oh my god this is close as well and the third one came and we were crouched down on this roof oh my god and i was like oh my god it felt even closer than all the rest of it and it, they were airburst and oh, it wow. fucking exploded yeah, on this yeah, roof yeah. there was there's maybe 12 it's a big old roof it was like yeah. maybe 12 of us <laughs> on there it was me my sniper buddy next was, was an officer from the royal irish um literally he he was stood next to us me and my buddy would crouch down like we were all fucking supposed to do, crouch down when the shit came yeah. in. And then there was a bunch of Royal, Royal Irish around and he just went boom, like brown out, like, like fucking hell. I blood pouring out my arm. Jared, my, the buddy next to me, was, was okay. Jared actually started a podcast for me. It was, I had a oh, co-host cool. early on, first 10 episodes, yeah. The officer was nowhere to be seen. And all he could do was screaming. There were oh six God. guys screaming. Yeah, they'd all been they, it, it, they'd all been hit. I was the one who got off lightest. Jesus. Uh, I just had a bit of shrapnel in my arm. And uh, six of them. Yeah, the officer had run. Who had been stood right next to us stood up. He had run himself off the roof to the med, to the the med room where the, where our medics and the doc was. He'd taken shrapnel in in, in through his in through Fuck. the side of his chest. And later, it transpired it stopped like four inches from, from his heart. Oh, yeah. Jesus Christ! Okay, fucking said my right. And they okay. said no, no, no. no it wasn't that was a loaded us. question. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now they said yeah. No, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't us. And I was like, it fucking was because I heard the first two rounds and the third round landed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Is this isn't coincidence. Jesus. Yeah, sons well, of bitches. It happened, but caveat this stuff happens i understand in heated circumstances i didn't I'm surprised like you it. even invited an artillery officer <laughs> to your podcast after that <laughs> i didn't realize until after i invited you oh but god no, okay. um no. but i only did i was only in one armored gunnery regiment and you move around as an officer so i did other stuff like, so uh what's uh, the artillery's perception of 7 ih naughty battery naughty battery oh, okay. okay yeah okay, um yeah. what's gonna say to you uh <laughs> i forgot what i was gonna say now you're going to apologise for your... Yeah, yeah, unit, yeah. So. I'm not going to anymore. <laughs> I'm not going to. <laughs> Don't judge me. <laughs> oh, that was it. The closest I've ever got to being hit by artillery, and it was absolutely nothing on your story, was we were... It was it was on exercise, but it was um, on Salisbury Plain and on the impact area. And I was... So I wasn't a fire support team commander or training to be a fire support team commander. Never got to deploy on it I, again. My, the peer group before us, was the, they were the ones that got to go on on the herricks and uh and they always said to us oh it'd be the best job you ever do was, yeah really souls were playing um but it's still cool it's still cool like you get to shout fire and down the net and <laughs> shit goes bang but you know so um we're on the impact area and the op the uh the observation post was actually directly opposite the gun target line uh, so where the guns were on the opposite side of the training area so we were like if you were there's a, there's a bird as the crow flies we were on the same line and I think somebody got something wrong in terms of the size of the charge or something because definitely overshot and I swear to God I was climbing out the turret and I fucking got back in again because this thing landed really? probably probably was like 100, 200 maybe a bit maybe even more but you suddenly realise like the size of a 155 round landing in front of you 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 get you get down quick and I remember thinking, fuck, We're not like, small banks. then that's not supposed to be there. Not <laughs> that's not banks, supposed right. to be there. You know, not small you think about how much, how, I mean, you think about how much of that kind of live firing training of any unit, of any type of ammunition or weapon system goes on year after year. You would think loads of people should be dying every year. It doesn't, it's a miracle it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't. happen. It's a miracle it doesn't happen. I, when I, I did a Dems course, uh, 
with the engineers. I said with the engineers, they fucking taught us. That was that was one of the most intensive courses I've done. That is actually yeah, my that's why my dad's theory. deaf. <laughs> <laughs> the theory on that man. Um, but I remember we were we were doing our final one of our final live firing fucking things, and we I can't remember what the area is. I can't remember where it was either. Where would, where would the where's the engineers? Um, uh, New Camberley. Cam- uh, yeah, right. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Minley Manor is where they do okay. a lot. Of is that the big, got the big valley there? Possibly, yeah, I think possibly. Yeah, yeah. so we went out, we went on the side of the valley, and basically we all had, we all got instructed. We got told what kind of charges we had to do to create, to put in place, and um, and on what kind of material. And we all side of this valley, we all put them in place, and then we all got wired back to this massive bunker. And uh, so I mean, maybe there was fifteen of us, and there was there was the firing unit. With 15 switches on it, or oh, the, however many switches on it, yeah. yeah. And uh, I remember the f- and, and part of it was knowing that you'd wired it right back, you put it in the device properly, so you, it was in the right switch, yeah. And I remember the, the first guy, student, going to uh set off his set off his charge, and everyone's in the bunk, and we're all looking across at the at the at the other side of the valley where all the charges are laid, we're all looking across, <laughs> and it's supposed to go from left to right, all the charges are like left to right across about 500 meters, whatever big it is. So he gets this thing and it's his charge and he, he flicks the switch and a fucking charge on the opposite <laughs> side oh of the God. He goes, boom! <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, we're all like, oh no, but oh, chuckling away. So like, big fat Freddy for you. Oh, <laughs> There's no, no power, big take that, a fail. That makes yeah. me think of, um, so I was part of a rapier unit, the air defense unit. That was my first ever posting. But rapier's been going out of service, I swear to God, for the last 50 years. I thought the RAF did that. So we took it on from them oh, right. years ago. So yeah, we took on ground-based air defence at that range, and um, we were up in the Hebrides where they do all the, we do all the firing, all the test firing. But these missiles are going out of service, right? They're just on in a big storage room facility, big storage facility, and they get sort of carted out for the two firing camps they do a year, whatever it is now, and it is being replaced. But this is ten years ago. And um, I was told that something in the region of 20% of these missiles go rogue. <laughs> so it used to be, this is like... <laughs> 20%? Or something cra- There's some sort of 20% failure rate or something like that. So it used to be years and years ago when Rapier was like in service, like in the 80s, um, uh, that you could sit outside the bunker and watch the firing. Now it's like, no, no, you get in the bunker. <laughs> and I remember being on the small arms range down the road doing concurrent activity. And that's the one time I you know, got to play with Tracer on with a GPMG, which was quite fun and running up and down the range. <laughs> and I remember watching these missiles and half of them were going and coming back on themselves. Um, oh my God. They have God. to have like a, kilo- a kilometre re- rear of the bunker that was part of the range set up. So yeah, that it's is, quite entertaining. That's a high percentage, yeah, 20%. Yeah. Of rogue missiles. Oh my god! Something like that. I'm pretty sure. If it was only high. people knew. <laughs> <laughs> this was ten years ago. That's fine. <laughs> it's like the ja- it's like when the javelin the javelin weapon system came out. The anti tank weapon system. Yeah. The javelin that came out and they, there's they have failure rates on the on the missiles on those and it's when they pull the trigger and the the the, the javelin comes out and just plops out the front. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Lands in front. You go, yeah, shit, that's what these shit. that's what these could do as well. It's like the second stage ignition hasn't kicked in. You're like, great. So it's right there. Brilliant. Brilliant, yeah, nuts. Um, what? So was it your military experience that drove you to do the mental health challenges last year? Yeah, I think, yeah. Because, I mean, like I said, we said before um, we started, like the military is just a huge part of my identity. I was a kid when I effectively joined. At tw- like, you know, went to university, joined at 21. And so I feel like my whole life has been, I've eaten, drank and slept and spoken the military for the last 10 years. It's really hard to think of myself in any other way and um I think in that time you just come across so many stories definitely and definitely towards the end of my career I became much more aware of what people had been through friends or colleagues whether they'd lost limbs or um you know they'd lost friends or and I think what stuck out for me the most is how much people were talking more about their mental health and it's it's obviously been a been a problem for years and years and years but I think people are just getting better at talking about it. And I didn't experience any trauma directly related to my military ser- military service, but I did go through like a, quite a traumatic phase in my own personal life. And it had an impact on while my... While you were serving? Yeah, while I, was, so while I was serving. So nothing to do with my job. But but when something happens to you that's traumatic, it, it, it immediately impacts your ability to operate. Can you talk about it or not? Uh, well, don't have to. Don't it, just have to. Feels a bit, it just feels a bit like it's nothing on people who've lost limbs or 
something no, in but the that's not, you know like you know that's not the right attitude to have about no it. i know i know and so for well for me it was just um a betrayal so i was deployed and my partner cheated on me while i was deployed and we'd been together a long long time and it's just um it's quite Did you find out while he was out there just when i got back oh my god but yeah so anyway and it's when you've been with someone for a long time that's not as insignificant no and i think when when you realize i'm like god how do people go through divorce i don't multiple times i don't know how they do it it destroy it destroys you like um because it depends on the reason of course but how do people stick with people who cheat yeah i don't i don't know that's fucking don't crazy know. as well yeah but it definitely you know i'd never really had many boyfriends or you know relationships when i was younger so it was really shocking and it sort of ripped my heart out of my body and and because he was serving as well and I was serving and our life had been the army you know it's it's definitely had an impact on my view of the military and whether or not I was happy there anymore and and I def and it just questions you just question everything you question your self-worth you question Were you in the same unit no no, oh, no. Okay. um but yeah you question your self-worth you question it just it just breaks down your resilience to like the base level because you just feel so betrayed by the someone you trusted like it's the closest person to you in the world and they and they and um and the trust has just gone. And it's like, yeah, I don't know how to describe it other than it breaks you down to like the, your bare bones and you and you have dark thoughts because you're like, my world isn't worth living anymore because this horrible thing has happened. And it, it seems silly talking about that now, but at the time, I just remember it being so traumatic for me. Well, it turns your understanding of reality <clears throat> on its head. Anything like that. Yeah. Like some massive, especially betrayal or something you thought you understood, which yeah. turned, just turns reality on its head. It yeah. changed your world, which was two seconds before uh, or orderly mm. into complete chaos. Yeah. I, 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 what I you thought, what that, you yeah. thought you knew. And I think what made it worse, and I won't get into too much detail, was that unfortunately it became quite public because the other person involved in the third person in that, that scenario put something on Facebook it got screenshotted and then it got shared around all the army, all the officer WhatsApp groups, you know, of our peer groups. So suddenly your personal life is everywhere. And that was like another level of just like, oh my God. you know, your personal life is just out there and all these things that this, your, the person who trusted has said about you, it, it, private things are just oh known. So that's not very nice. And, and suddenly your world is like on fire and that just spirals. And you, and I think I've read it before where you people go through, Cheatings or divorces, you know, you don't eat as very well, you don't sleep very well, you know. And it would be so easy to spiral into, like, drinking or finding other means to dis um, distract yourself from the problem and the heartache and the whatever. And, and I, I've never known something to so emotionally driven to have such a physical impact on your body. And I think that happens to a lot of people in those situations. Anyway, like I said, there are worse things in life than being cheated on, but it was pretty horrible but it made me much more empathetic to people who'd gone through traumatic experiences because ultimately what I was going through was a form of grief I was grieving a life that I thought I had a person who I thought I loved who no longer existed in my life and probably grieving the old version of me because I'm I'm definitely a different person now and um for the better yeah I think definitely and I was one thing I would say is that I was listening to another podcast. Apologies, <laughs> the Diary of a CEO. Have you read? Yeah, I've heard, a massive one. I've heard of it. I've um, heard of it. And he talked about trauma. And apparently, ninety or eighty nine percent of people who are asked if they would, um, if they would lose the lessons that they had now by not having that trauma, would they something like along those lines? Uh, would they? Um, would they not have that trauma happen to, that happen to them if they didn't know the lessons that they know now? And they all went, no, I don't, I'd, I'd still have it happen to me because I think you learn from those experiences and you get stronger and, and so on. But anyway, going back to mental, res mental resilience, basically, I realised I was so angry. I was so angry that my resilience, both physical and mental, had been like just destroyed. And I thought, this is not cool. And I started to really empathise with friends I started having conversations with other people in the military and I'd started engaging with the welfare service and with therapy and and here you were in yeah oh, that's good and while I and I and I was like it was good because it put my problem into perspective definitely and which definitely which always helps and I was like shit people are dealing this is like so common people are dealing with mental health issues daily and it doesn't ma it doesn't matter everyone's pain is relative it can be that your long-term partner cheats on you it can be that you've lost a family yeah. member it can be that you've lost a limb it can be that your child is terminally ill Th that all those things have an impact 
on your mental health. It doesn't, you know, and it's just, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how, you, what you look like, your mental resilience can be affected. And I just, that just got me really passionate about it. And I just, I don't know, maybe as a, as a junior officer, I got asked, I got asked to give a soldier, one of my soldiers came to me d- week one, day seven, mom, I'm 32. This is what he said, but on these lines, I'm paraphrasing. He said, I'm 32 years old. I've got three kids and my wife's divorcing me. Have you got, have you got any advice? And I remember being like, mate, I have got a clue. I've got no life experience, you know, went to university. That doesn't, and whereas 10 years later, I feel like I've got, like, I've got, um, some experience in some of those areas and I can actually genuinely empathize and it's not sympathy it's I I fucking understand how that feels and how that manifests physically in your body and how that stops you from operating at your optimum level and what your and the negative spirals that you go into and and the ways not to react and the ways that you can help yourself and I just yeah but ultimately, I decided to cho- cl- close that chapter in my life. I thought, do you know what? That sort of public, although I had lots of support from the military and I was very proud to be in the army at that time f- because of the support I received, I thought it was just too much of a, like, I don't know, ripping in my in my identity. And it was just time to close that chapter. And that's partly why I left, uh, on top of sort of just wanting to try something new. And, and I thought, but I don't want to just jump into a new career I want to take a break and I want to do something of me with meaning and with purpose when did you leave so I left in August last year well oh of, I didn't realize it was that yeah that, quite recent. not that long ago yeah okay yeah yeah and I thought Keep I'm, I'm gonna grab the yeah yeah and I thought um I'm gonna take the opportunity to do some fundraising um for a mental health charity and for veterans because I just I fucking love the army and I think mental health is important and uh I want to do all the things that I've always wanted to try and do, um, all these challenges. Um, yeah, what well, else? It, I it's, it, you know, you, you, not everyone goes through that level of pain and grief. You know, to your point, everything's relative. Yeah. But I think, I, I really think like the most, the most valuable people, some of the most valuable people when it comes to advocating for, um, mental health support, mental ill health support, and uh, and you know showing that showing people who are really struggling that you can get through it. It are people who can who one have been through it, but two and understand how and why they went through it and what the implications are self for, and then th- and then three are able to articulate mm. to other people and empathise with other people the lessons that will be relevant to them for yeah. it. You know, one of the, I was thinking about this this morning, I can't remember what I was thinking about. I was literally thinking, I've got two daughters. And, um, and sort of one of the things in the back of my mind at the moment for, uh, for a while is, you know, this, the, I've been hearing for a while there's like an uptick in r- real bad mental ill health with young girls. And it really worries me because I've got daughters. And uh, I was literally thinking this morning, is it, if I can, one thing I I think I need to send this to them, but not in a way that I'm patronizing. I need, it's just like <laughs> yeah. one lesson. If I could tell anyone who was ill or even healthy, it was one lesson I could tell anyone about mental mental health, mental ill health. It's like if I had to choose one, it's that when you when you start going down a a, a bad path mentally, like you, you you're not well, you're getting ill, your brain starts playing tricks on you, and it it will present an alternative reality to you than what is actually the truth. And the worst way that manifests itself is that you will tell yourself and you will think there is no way out, there is no hope you can get, there is no help you can get, there are no options. There's nothing you can do about your shit situation that you're in or that you think you're in. And your brain will tell you that. And that's it. If I could tell anyone one thing, it's that. So when you think everything is a nightmare, remember that thing. It isn't a nightmare. Your brain's telling you it is. It isn't true. Don't believe it. Yeah. Don't believe it. Because because I think ultimately that's why a lot of the suicides happen. Because of that, not that one thing, but Mm -hmm. the the brain is tricking people into thinking, I'm fucked. This is it. I'm fucked. I've got this pain forever. Yeah. And it's going to get worse. Nobody can help. No one can understand. There's no way out. Yeah. It's the most horrible aspect of when I was, when I've had my mental ill health in the past, that, that bit. Yeah. Like, fuck. I think, and I don't know about you, but I've, I knew I was never going to act on any of the dark thoughts I had because 
And lucky for me, I had a support network around me, like amazing parents, amazing group of female friends, actually, particularly at the time. Um, but it didn't mean I didn't have thoughts where you're driving along and you're like, this is my mom's going to hate me that saying this, but you just think it would be easier, it would be less painful to just turn my car into such a res- reservation and that would end this pain. And that's like a horrible thing. And then that makes you sad and it makes you angry because you're like, this, you know, this isn't me, but this is what I'm thinking and I can't stop thinking it. But that's rung, well, that's one rung closer to actually doing it. I know you're saying like you would never do it, but if if it's an alternative person yeah. who doesn't have that awareness, who doesn't Support have that network. experience of previous mental ill health, yeah. maybe not in just yourself, in others, yeah. or or exposure to mental health knowledge and training that yeah. we're so benef- we're so lucky now. We as a you know as people who live in the UK and we as people who have been part of a military, where it's like to the tail end of my military career, it was certainly getting better but it's not as good as it is now we're very lucky to have that experience but people who don't have mm. that experience they they drop to the next yeah. rung down yeah you know and, and then they get closer and closer to the bottom rung before yeah. they drop off into a fucking abyss where oh. they ain't coming back yeah my friend the other day a very good friend of mine that we met actually just after that happened and we connected really really closely he was um actually uh ex para he sorry he transit he transferred to oh god one of the guards regiments or something what <laughs> i know what <laughs> but he um give me his name no. after this i'm gonna <laughs> him down <laughs> don't uh, say it on no, air no, no. <laughs> uh, but no he um and i don't think what the fuck was he doing i don't know i don't, I don't think he'll mind me saying because he's quite he's, he's an influencer now as well it's quite it's disgusting um but yeah no he um Sorry, what's going to say? Yeah, so he does a lot on TikTok and and um, Facebook and whatever the new apps are on mental health. And he actually released a video recently and admitted that he'd when as he left the army last year or the year before, um, he'd stood on top of a bridge Jesus. and considered. And I was like, "Fuck me!" Like I knew you were struggling. We were sort of going through our own mental health issues at that time together, and we bonded it. We actually bonded over that. It was quite trauma bonding's not healthy. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, and I was like, I didn't actually know that you'd gone and stood on top of a bridge like fuck you know and i don't that's the i think that's the thing we just don't know what everyone is going through you don't know from looking at someone and it's so easy to judge isn't it it's so easy to judge someone's background and experience and yeah like i said everyone's pain is relative so mm. don't judge yeah trauma bond trauma bonding works sometimes yeah. I, got a friend who, I got a friend who got a couple of friends and they i've interviewed her twice and he left the military we we served together he left the military went out to afghanistan long so short he went out cp CP was looking after looking after a company in a compound in a place called kunduz in afghanistan which later on i think it was what year was that 20 i can't remember what year it was uh anyway ended up sky sky news front and center because it got smashed by five suicide bombers afghan taliban but they didn't blow themselves up straight away they tried clearing the house first and then blew themselves up long story short she got shot another friend of mine who was out there also got killed my friend trauma bonding point i brought this up he got shot as well and uh they now they married each other and they uh, they they did have a relationship Mm -hmm. at the time but they were the only they sort of connected on this thing common shared experience i remember the point the point i'm making this is remember when they got together um, about six months later, maybe, and they came and lived at my house in the UK uh, for a, a good a good while um, together. And I remember thinking, it it can't be good them being together because all they've got is this, Share this thing. negative thing. Yeah, they're never gonna get away from it. Not that I'm suggesting any trauma like that should be completely forgotten, but it's like it's always I thought it's always gonna be there and present and that's gonna be a miserable existence I literally thought that I've never told them this yeah but I literally thought it's gonna be a miserable existence no and actually it hasn't like now yeah. they, they, they live in the UK he's uh, he's British anyway she wasn't she's not British they live in the UK they've got kids and it seems to be fine yeah and it, it was a, I think it was 20 when was it 2016 no 2012 or 2013 it happened you know and it's worked out but yeah. much like completely contrary to what I, I thought but I think that's kind of a, yeah. a unique case yeah. oh I mean I, I kind of joke because we actually end up we're now probably best friends I would say but uh, yeah we definitely understood each other more than other potentially people outside of that bubble of mental health yeah but um, it's definitely important to have people that understand around you when you're going through that 
Mm. For sure. Mm. And don't just distract yourself. Make progress. I think that's the key. That's what got me through. Like time, it gen- it's, as frustrating as it is when someone says time is the only healer, it fucking is. <laughs> it's nothing else I don't think fixes the problem. Time and making progress towards something that matters to you. Uh, or do you disagree? Is it time or is it experiences? Because yeah. time is not going to be a healer. If no. you stay at home, you do nothing, you true. don't challenge yourself, true, you true, sit true. there and you wallow your own self-pity. Yeah. Which is a quite easy trap to fall into, especially yeah. you don't have a support network around you. Yeah. Or you don't think you have a support network around you. You know, so get out there. Mm. You have to kind of why Lily, my dog exists, was like, I need trauma something dog. to make me feel better. <laughs> yeah, she's a trauma dog. I was like, I want a puppy. And now I regret it. No, I'm <laughs> no, I love her. She's just annoying. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you have to have a reason to get out of bed for sure. And if you don't have children, if you don't have, um, you know, if you're, you're, if the army, for example, is really supportive and just says, you know, you take what time you need, actually, in a way, you kind of need them to be like, get in the office. So what's your reason for getting out of bed now? Oh, Apart just, from Lily. I think I've opened this Pandora's box of experiences. So probably you're probably bang on. Um, and I just want more. Yeah. I want to I wanna live on a high as much as possible. So how are you? Get, go on. What, what's, what's well, just like then? constantly I'm like, I want to raise the bar. Like in the army, you think you do cool shit. And I'm sure you probably have done way more cool shit than I have. Um, but I, I... And uh, I don't know. I just, I like the adventure and Lynn Rush. I like... Maybe it's just that desire to feel more. Maybe that's maybe that's unhealthy, but I want to be wowed and I want to be impressed and I want to be excited and I want I want all the positive emotions. And maybe that's me just massively counteracting. <laughs> but and maybe it's dangerous in the sense that you know I have this. My friend has this phrase: allergic to average, and I like that. But but also. Life can be kind of average sometimes and you should be okay with that. But it's important to step up your game when you can and go and do some cool, exciting things that are going to develop you and test you and challenge you. Have you ever done psychedelics? <laughs> I'm still in the army. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I haven't. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I... I yeah, I, would, I mean, you talk about Belize and, and things like that and you've got ayahuasca in South America and you've got... Uh, that is definitely something I okay. would recommend. <laughs> no <Recommend>, comment. <laughs> honestly, well, I, um, yeah, it's a subject that's been. I, I, I've, I've got a lot of focus on it in the last few years because of from the mental health aspect. You know, I've got a got friends who uh, I got a, a f- one friend who uh, who runs a charity called uh, Heroic Hearts UK. Oh, cool. And they one of the things they're doing is campaigning to uh, uh, reschedule rescheduled psilocybin so magic mushroom compound oh, wow. psychedelic compound for research and oh, medical wow. application here in the uk okay. uh and they but they also provide they provide free retreats for veterans who suffer from mental ill health ayahuasca retreats in peru oh, wow. and retreats in the netherlands as well in the netherlands i think that's psilocybin based but peru is ayahuasca uh, so the, the benefit and i have first-hand experience of of oh really psychedelics in the positive way okay like, cool no that's cool fucking mind-blowing like Are you really your view of the world and of yourself can change it subtle change yeah but huge huge yeah huge like I, I have had uh i do still have sometimes like big problems with anxiety and that stems from other stuff real hit, horrendous anxiety and one of the one of the major changes to that and how it impacted me and how it manifested itself was after my first psychedelic experience. Oh, wow. yes. Add that to the list of uh, bucket list. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll talk more on that. <laughs> um, actually, what I, should, I should probably make sure I say is that um, there are so many amazing charities out there, and you mentioned one there, but the Veterans Foundation. That's who you raised the money for last year. Yes, the Veterans Foundation. I, should, I definitely need to tell me sure about I the Veterans them. Foundation. What do they do? I've uh, heard of them before, but I don't yeah, really know so they're quite new. So they were set up, I think, seven years ago now uh, by Major General Sh- uh, David Shaw, who was a gunner general. Um, so it was a good in for me. And uh, but I like the idea of them because I was I was like really trying to figure out who I wanted to raise money for because there are so there's about eighteen hundred veterans charities out there which is crazy ridiculous it's crazy and my uncle who was ex-military was like why do we need another bloody charity and i was like well 
the thing is there are so many niche requirements so there are niche charities and but the what i liked about the veterans foundation is that they they actually run a lottery so they weren't doing a lot of fundraising they were just running a lottery and the excess money goes to smaller charities so the bigger charities like help for heroes or abf they have quite a good marketing strategy and they're well known, they're well established. But there are lots of smaller charities like Scotty's Little Soldiers or. Love uh, Scotty's. I've had, I've had uh, Nicola on the podcast. Oh, amazing. Yeah. So, yeah, I've yeah. like tagged them and stuff. But lots of smaller charities. And they make. So, the Veterans Charity gives grants to the charities that maybe need them most. Oh, so, they I help didn't distri- know redistribute that. money. The Veterans Foundation does that. Does that, yeah. Didn't so, know that. I really like that because. Veterans Foundation or Veterans Charity? Ve- the Veterans Foundation. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay, all right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so I love that because that means I didn't have to choose because <laughs> I was like, how do I how do I possibly choose where this goes? And they have like five or six different pots. It might have been combating, uh, supporting combat injury, um, but like bereavement, homelessness and education, uh, but also mental health. So I was like, well, great, because I can say that the money that I've raised has gone into that pot and uh, they'll make sure it goes to the right charities. How do they select the charities it goes to? Uh, I think they just it's done, done case by case if if the charities want to be um, so they can connected apply for they grant. can apply to ah. the veterans charity yeah oh, and, you, like and then you your, in, uh, yourself you can apply for lottery you can pay for lottery tickets and you might win a small amount of money as well oh, so, it's, so they are money prizes eh? yeah money prizes for you if you sign up but also they take a big proportion of that and give them as grants so uh, I've got it here in front um, I thought it was quite yeah. Nice concept. That is pretty good. Veteransfoundation.org.uk. How much did you raise last year for them? So we had an amazing sponsor called Root Technologies, another veteran. and Root. Root, R-O-U-T-T-E. They're um, uh, like an uh, energy, a sustainable energy um, company that's up and coming. It's to do with, uh, uh, so Anthony, his name's Anthony, the CEO. Um, and the idea being that the energy from cars going over this technology will uh, create and store energy that can be redistributed. So it's a sustainable energy source. So that was my major sponsor. I feel like I spoke to this guy on the phone. And Anthony. Um, is this is this is this small wind turbines on the side of the road? No. Oh, okay. Well, unless there's a turbine element of it, I'm not sure. But okay. Anthony, um, I can't think of his last name off the top of my head right now, but. Um, yeah, it's his concept. And he pledged uh, £20,000 to the cause, which was amazing. Wow. And I was like jumping for joy at that point because like someone finally gets it. Um, but I, I think to, to date, they've not, they're, quite, they're quite a new company. So yeah, I think money is sort of, it comes when it comes sort of thing. And so uh, in total, they've given me, I think, f- uh, I think they've given me 10 on top of the 10 that I raised separately. So amazing. I think I raised 20 grand. So yeah, so... Um, Still waiting on potentially another ten to five, five to ten thousand pounds, but I was happy because I, in my mind, I was like, if I if I raise a thousand pounds per challenge, I'm happy because I wasn't thinking very big. I was just sort of like, I'll just do this and hope for the best. And because fundraising is such a huge undertaking, it's horrible, it's, isn't it? It's you're it's putting horrible. yourself out there, and it's like a whole marketing it's strategy. It's crazy. Can you imagine being the CEO of a charity? Oh gosh, I couldn't do it. no, I, I don't want to do, do it again it. for a long time. No, no, because no. you just and also you feel so guilty whenever you're not doing something fundraising orientated you feel like mm-hmm. every second of your day should be focused on another strategy another avenue of approach yeah um should you be doing i don't know should i be standing at bus stops <laughs> with a bucket you know <laughs> what yeah. can i do to get more money in um and so the challenge is by the you know putting them aside the hardest thing last year was um just trying to f- think of ways like i'd say 80 percent of my time was spent doing the background fundraising work. It was really? like, a, like a full-time job. Yeah, I can imagine, actually. I can imagine. Well, so what, what are you going to do next, then? If, if, you, if that's a lot of stress to be doing the charity <laughs> fundraising, what's your next plan to keep you going? Uh, so I have one challenge that was we weren't able to do because the weather got too dangerous to do it last year, which was to climb the Matterhorn. Um, which the Matterhorn. Matterhorn, which is the famous Toblerone mountain. Um, and, yeah, it's too dangerous to climb. Italy. Italy, Zermatt, yeah. yeah. And... Uh, yeah, so we've actually rescheduled that for next year, and I'll prob- and I'll reopen the funding pot for that because I'm not actually a very good mountaineer. So it'll so be next a good, year you're gonna do it. good challenge. Yeah. What are you going to do if you train it? Lots of mountaineering in Snowdonia and scrambling in the Lake District, and yeah, just trying to up my game a bit. 
Have you got anyone you can lean in to get experience? So I've joined the Army Mountaineering Associ- Association, so I'm hoping to get on a few of their weekends. Yeah, I'll, If you want, I'll connect you up with a couple of people, a couple of previous guests, actually. Oh, one yeah. who nearly killed himself training for the Matterhorn. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That'd be great advice. <laughs> I got some great advice from him. Yeah. Chris Shirley, ex-bootneck officer. Okay. He's, he's, he now lives in Estonia. But he's an awesome dude. Uh, got a marketing company now. Um, yeah, uh, branding, brand and marketing company now. And the other guy is... Um, uh, he runs Monkey Mountaineering. Oh, yes. I've, 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 I think I follow it. No, I think, well, I think we've spoken on LinkedIn or Instagram um, or something. He is well worth connecting. Because I think I reached out to him like, do you have any jobs? <laughs> <laughs> but he's a great guy. Yeah. I've got to get his name. I can't, I can't believe I've forgotten his bloody name. We're nearly done, by the way. Uh, Monkey Mountaineering, Monkey Mountaineering. Who is it? Monkey Mountaineering. You'll say his name. Paul Spackman. Paul Spackman he just jumped into my head no I'm sure or maybe it's another Monkey one Mountaineering, I've definitely heard of Monkey Mountaineering the episode. Uh, uh, Sam Marshall for uh, God's sake sorry Sam for getting your name <laughs> Jesus Christ man. <laughs> you might excuse have I have our 214 guests now <laughs> uh, wow that's impressive yeah so check out Sam okay and if you want connect up with Chris I connect with Chris but knowledge experience yeah, and yeah, tips yeah. and device it's really hard to tell if it's harder than it's being said or if it's being over egged because some art when you do your research some articles are like you will die it's I, the I most heard, dangerous I, thing I, in I the world the Matterhorn is pretty horrendous it's t- yeah. Yeah, Chris, yeah. it was Chris who told me yeah yeah Chris had told me yeah it's altitude right I did Mont Blanc and I vomited twice on the way up oh really <laughs> so I think I've never done anything major like that yeah. never done anything major uh, yeah. yeah Sam invited me out to, Mor- to go and do a, 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 I think a trip in Morocco but I just couldn't do it yeah. Away, but I'd love to do that. Love mountains. Yeah, get some mountains yeah. in you. It's good. Good for the soul. Yeah, we're um we're coming up the time. Yes. What have we not mentioned that you wanted to mention? Uh, probably the challenges themselves. But what from last year? Yeah. Did you want to talk through? No, no, no. Well, do oh, you we got time. You got no, to talk no, through. No. Absolutely. No, no. Well, I suppose, to be honest, you could just refer to it, and I've spoken about them so much. I actually prefer what we talked about. <laughs> <laughs> you could just be like, "Gender these challenges and raise." Well, on grand. the challenges, can people still donate? Yes, I get the funding pot open. Okay, so t- where's that then? Uh, so that is, uh, you can go to the Veterans Foundation website and look at the fundraising tab. Veteransfoundation.org.uk. Yeah, yeah, or I do have a website still running, which is genevolve.co.uk, which is J-E-N-N-E-V-O-L-V-E. So it's like evolution, gen, it's like challenge, uh, that kind of thing. J-E-N-N-O-V-L-E. So J-E-N-N-E-V-O. <laughs> LVE. Yeah, I know. I realised that. Com. I realised later it wasn't the easiest thing to say on. Is on it? Is it dot com? Dot co. UK. Dot co. UK. Don't worry about it. People do it all the time. Um, I had a friend uh, who asked me to build a website for him. This is many years ago, and I said, "Okay, yeah, no worries. What's the name of the company?" And it was a Quiro. Oh God, who's Sa- I just felt that? Quiro Scientia <laughs> Surveillance. Well, problem number one is how the fuck do you spell it? Yeah. <laughs> like problem number two is when you abbreviate it, it's ass. Oh A-S-S. no. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's no longer called that name. Yeah, no, it's yeah. a different company now. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. but um, yeah, you can donate because Genevol.co.uk. Yeah, oh, I think so. www.genevol. J E N N. Yeah. E V O L V E. O L V E. Oh, Gen Evolve. Gen Evolve. Gen Evolve. Gen Evolve. Oh, like Gen God Evolution. Um, okay, right. Gen Evolve. Yeah, because I've been doing a couple of, like, I've been to schools and a couple of cadet forces to talk about it. So um, I keep the pot, pot open in case anyone wants to oh, good. All stick right. a few so quid in. I'll put the link to the Thank you. website because we've just butchered describing the name of it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll put the link to the Thank you. Oh, yeah. Um, and but yeah, I would fully recommend. Yeah. It's tough. It's hard work going off and doing um, fundraising challenges, but. I think the benef- it's mutually beneficial for the charities, for the awareness, um, and for yourself individually. It's like a bit of personal development. And I met some amazing people last year that I would never have met if I hadn't sort of put myself out there and and done it. So amazing! Yeah. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank a you real so pleasure much. talking to you. I really enjoyed it. I feel like I could have gone on for hours, which is dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> you got like, Jen, shut the fuck up. <laughs> I got no problem telling off so that <laughs> no no problem whatsoever. Um, good luck with the challenges. I'll put Thank a link you. to this in the blurb. And um, yeah. hey, thanks to Dave Davis again for connecting yeah, us up. I hope it was reasonable. He will be happy. Okay. He's easily pleased. Okay. He'll be happy. No, it was very. It's a real pleasure to talk to you. Cool. Really enjoyed Thank it. You so good luck. Much. Thank thanks. you. Done. Cool. Thanks. That was really.